Dracula by Bram Stoker. Επιμέλεια Γιώργος Πιτροπογιανάκης. The Log of the Demeter. Varna to Whitby. Written the 18th of July. Things so strange happening that I shall keep accurate note henceforth till we land. On July the 6th, we finished taking in cargo, silver sand, boxes of earth. At noon, set sail. East wind fresh. Crew, five hands. Two mates, cook, and myself, captain. On the 11th of July at dawn, entered Bosporus, boarded by Turkish customs officers. Bakshish. All correct, underway at 4 p.m. On July the 12th, through Dardanelles. More customs officers and flagboat of guarding squadron. Back sheesh again. Work of officers thorough but quick. Want us off soon. At dark, passed into archipelago. On July the 13th, passed Cape Matapan. Crew dissatisfied about something, seemed scared but would not speak out. On July the 14th, was somewhat anxious about crew. Men, all steady fellows, who sailed with me before. Mate could not make out what was wrong. They only told him there was something, and crossed themselves. Mate lost temper with one of them that day, and struck him. Expected fierce quarrel, but all was quiet. On July the 16th, Mate reported in the morning that one of the crew, Petrovsky, was missing. Could not account for it. Took larboard watch, eight bells last night, was relieved by Abramov, but did not go to bunk. Men, more downcast than ever. All said they expected something of the kind, but would not say more than that there was something on board. Mate, getting very impatient with them, feared some trouble ahead. On July the 17th, yesterday, one of the men, Olgaren, came to my cabin and in an awestruck way confided to me that he thought there was a strange man aboard the ship. He said that in his watch he had been sheltering behind the deck house as there was a rainstorm, when he saw a tall, thin man, who was not like any of the crew, come up the companionway, go along the deck forward and disappear. He followed cautiously, but when he got to the bows found no one and the hatchways were all closed. He was in a panic of superstitious fear and I am afraid the panic may spread. To allay this panic, I shall today search entire ship carefully from stem to stern. Later in the day, I got together the whole crew and told them, as they evidently thought there was someone in the ship, we should search from stem to stern. First mate, angry, said it was folly and to yield to such foolish ideas would demoralize the men. Said he would engage to keep them out of trouble with a hand spike. I let him take the helm while the rest began thorough search, all keeping abreast with lanterns. We left no corner unsearched. As there were only the big wooden boxes, there were no corners where a man could hide. Men much relieved when the search was over and went back to work cheerfully. First mate scowled but said nothing. July the 22nd. Rough weather last three days and all hands busy with sails. No time to be frightened. Men seem to have forgotten their dread. Men cheerful again, and all on good terms. Praised men for work in bad weather. Pasture brought her, and out through the straits. All well. July the 24th. There seems some doom over this ship. Already a hand short, and entering on the Bay of Biscay with wild weather ahead, last night... Another man lost, disappeared. Like the first, he came off his watch and was not seen again. Men all in a panic of fear. Sent around Robin, asking to have double watch, as they feared to be alone. Mate, violent. Fear there will be some trouble, as either he or the men will do some violence. July the 28th. Four days in hell, knocking about in a sort of maelstrom, and the wind a tempest. No sleep for anyone. Men all worn out. Hardly know how to set a watch, since no one is fit to go on. 
second mate volunteered to steer and watch, and that men snatch a few hours sleep. Wind abating, seas still terrific, but feel them less as the ship is steadier. July the 29th. Another tragedy. Had single watch tonight, as crew too tired to double. When morning watch came on deck, could find no one except steersman. Raised our cry, and all came on deck. Thorough search, but no one found. Are now without second mate, and crew in a panic. Mate and I agreed to go armed henceforth, and to wait for any sign of cause. July the 30th, last night. Rejoiced, we are nearing England. Weather fine, all sails set. Retired, worn out. Slept soundly. Awakened by mate telling me that both men on watch and the steersman missing. Only self, mate, and two hands left to work ship. August the 1st. Two days of fog, and not a sail sighted. Had hoped, when in the English Channel, to be able to signal for help, or to get in somewhere. Not having power to work sails, have to run before wind. Dare not lower, as could not raise them again. We seem to be drifting to some terrible doom. Mate now more demoralized than either of them. His stronger nature seems to have worked inwardly against himself. Men are beyond fear, working stolidly, patiently, with minds made up to worst. They are Russian, he Romanian. 2nd of August, midnight. Woke up from few minutes' sleep by hearing a cry, seemingly outside my port. Could see nothing in fog. Rushed on deck and ran against mate. Tells me he heard cry and ran, but no sign of man on watch. One more gone. Lord help us. Mate says we must be past Straits of Dover, as in a moment of fog lifting he saw North Foreland just as he heard the man cry out. If so, we are now off in the North Sea, and only God can guide us in this fog, which seems to move with us. And God seems to have deserted us. August the 3rd. At midnight I went to relieve the man at the wheel, but when I got there, found no one there. The wind was steady, and as we ran before it, there was no yawing. I dared not leave it, so shouted for the mate. After a few seconds, he rushed on deck in his flannels. He looked wild-eyed and haggard, and I greatly fear his reason has given way. He came close to me, and whispered hoarsely with his mouth to my ear, as though fearing the very air might hear, It is here. I know it now. On the watch last night, I saw it, like a man, tall and thin, and ghastly pale. It was in the bows, and looking out. I crept behind it, and gave it my knife, but the knife went through it, empty as the air. As he spoke, he took his knife, and drove it savagely into space. Then he went on, but it is here and I'll find it. It is in the hold, perhaps in one of those boxes. I'll unscrew them one by one and see. You work the helm. And with a warning look and his finger on his lip, he went below. There was springing up a choppy wind, and I could not leave the helm. I saw him come out on deck again with the tool chest and a lantern, and go down the forward hatchway. He is mad, stark raving mad, and it is no use my trying to stop him. He can't hurt those big boxes, they are invoiced as clay, and to pull them about is as harmless a thing as he can do. So here I stay and mind the helm and write these notes. I can only trust in God and wait till the fog clears. Then if I can't steer to any harbour with the wind that is, I shall cut down sails and lie by, and signal for help. It is nearly 
all over now. Just as I was beginning to hope that the mate would come out calmer, for I heard him knocking away at something in the hold, and work is good for him, there came up the hatchway a sudden startled scream which made my blood run cold. Up on the deck he came as if shot from a gun, a raging madman, with his eyes rolling and his face convulsed with fear. Save me! Save me! he cried, and then looked round on the blanket of fog. His horror turned to despair, and in a steady voice he said, You had better come too, Captain, before it is too late. He is there. I know the secret now. The sea will save me from him, and it is all that is left. Before I could say a word or move forward to seize him, he sprang to the bulwark and deliberately threw himself into the sea. I suppose I know the secret too now. It was this madman who had got rid of the men one by one and now he has followed them himself. God help me. How am I to account for all these horrors when I get to port? When I get to port? Will that ever be? August the 4th. Still fog, which the sunrise cannot pierce. I know there is sunrise, because I am a sailor. Why else I know not? I dared not go below, I dared not leave the helm, so here all night I stayed, and in the dimness of the night I saw it, him. God forgive me, but the mate was right to jump overboard. It is better to die like a man, to die like a sailor in blue water, no man can object. But I am a captain and I must not leave my ship. But I shall baffle this fiend or monster, for I shall tie my hands to the wheel when my strength begins to fail, and along with them I shall tie that which he, it, dare not touch. And then, come good wind or foul, I shall save my soul and my honour as a captain. I am growing weaker, and the night is coming on. If he can look me in the face again, I may not have time to act. If we are wrecked, mayhap this bottle may be found, and those who find it may understand. If not, well then all men shall know I have been true to my trust. God and the Blessed Virgin and the saints help a poor ignorant soul trying to do his duty. Of course the verdict was an open one. There is no evidence to adduce. And whether or not the man himself committed the murders, there is none now to say. The folk hold almost universally here that the captain is simply a hero and he is to be given a public funeral. Already it is arranged that his body is to be taken with a train of boats up the Esk for a piece, then brought back to Tate Hill Pier and up the Abbey Steps, for he is to be buried in the churchyard on the cliff. The owners of more than a hundred boats have already given in their names as wishing to follow him to the grave. No trace has ever been found of the great dog, at which there is much mourning, for with public opinion in its present state he would, I believe, be adopted by the town. Tomorrow we'll see the funeral, and so will end this one more mystery of the sea. Mina Murray's Journal, August the 8th. Lucy was very restless all night, and I too could not sleep. The storm was fearful, and as it boomed loudly among the chimney pots, it made me shudder. When a sharp puff came, it seemed to be like a distant gun. Strangely enough, Lucy did not wake, but she got up twice and dressed herself. Fortunately, each time I awoke in time and managed to undress her without waking her and got her back to bed. 
It is a very strange thing, this sleepwalking, for as soon as her will is thwarted in any physical way, her intention, if there be any, disappears, and she yields herself almost exactly to the routine of her life. Early in the morning we both got up and went down to the harbour to see if anything had happened in the night. There were very few people about, and though the sun was bright and the air clean and fresh, the big, grim-looking waves, that seemed dark themselves, because the foam that topped them was like snow, forced themselves in through the narrow mouth of the harbour, like a bullying man going through a crowd. Somehow I felt glad that Jonathan was not at sea last night, but on land. But oh, oh, is he on land or sea? Where is he? And how? I am getting fearfully anxious about him. If only I knew what to do, and could do anything. August the 10th. The funeral of the poor sea captain today was most touching. Every boat in the harbour seemed to be there, and the coffin was carried by captains all the way from Tate Hill Pier up to the churchyard. Lucy came with me, and we went early to our old seat whilst the cortege of boats went up the river to the viaduct and came down again. We had a lovely view and saw the procession nearly all the way. The poor fellow was laid to rest quite near our seat, so that we stood on it when the time came and saw everything. Poor Lucy seemed much upset. She was restless and uneasy all the time, and I cannot but think that her dreaming at night is telling on her. She is quite odd in one thing. She will not admit to me that there is any cause for restlessness, or if there is, she does not understand it herself. There is an additional cause, in that poor old Mr. Swales was found dead this morning on our seat, his neck being broken. He had evidently, as the doctor said, fallen back in the seat in some sort of fright, for there was a look of fear and horror on his face that the men said made them shudder. Poor dear old man! Perhaps he had seen death with his dying eyes. Lucy is so sweet and sensitive that she feels influences more acutely than other people do. Just now she was quite upset by a little thing which I did not much heed, though I am myself very fond of animals. One of the men who come up here often to look for the boats was followed by his dog. The dog is always with him. They are both quiet persons, and I never saw the man angry, nor heard the dog bark. During the service the dog would not come to its master, who was on the seat with us, but kept a few yards off, barking and howling. Its master spoke to it gently, then harshly, and then angrily, but it would neither come to nor cease to make a noise. It was in a sort of fury, with its eyes savage, all its hairs bristling like a cat's tail when puss is on the warpath. Then finally the man too got angry, and jumped down and kicked the dog, then took it by the scruff of the neck, and half dragged and half threw it onto the tombstone on which the seat was fixed. The moment it touched the stone, the poor thing became quiet and fell all into a tremble. It did not try to get away, but it crouched down, quivering and cowering, and was in such a pitiable state of terror that I tried, though without effort, to comfort it. Lucy was full of pity too, but she did not attempt to touch the dog, but looked at it in a sort of agonized way. I greatly fear she is of a too supersensitive nature to go through the world without trouble. She will be dreaming of this tonight, I am sure of that. The whole agglomeration of things, the ship steered into port by a dead man, his attitude tied to the wheel with a crucifix and beads, the touching funeral, the dog now furious, now in terror. This will all afford material for her dream. Same day, 11 o'clock p.m. Oh, but I am tired. If it were not that I have made my diary a duty, I should not open it tonight. We had a lovely walk. Lucy, after a while, was in gay spirits, owing, I think, to some dear cows who came nosing towards us in a field close to the lighthouse and frightened the wits out of us. I believe we forgot everything, except, of course, personal fear, and it seemed to wipe the slate clean and give us a fresh start. We had a capital severe tea at Robin Hood's Bay in a sweet little old-fashioned inn with a bow window right over the seaweed-covered rocks of the Strand. I believe we should have shocked the new woman with our appetites. Men are more tolerant, bless them. Then we walked home with some, or rather many, stoppages to rest 
and with our hearts full of a constant dread of wild bulls. Lucy was really tired, and we intended to creep off to bed as soon as we could. The young curate came in, however, and Mrs. Westenra asked him to stay for supper. Lucy and I both had a fight for it with the dusty miller. I know it was a hard fight on my part, and I'm quite heroic. I think that some day the bishops must get together and see about breeding up a new class of curates who don't take supper, no matter how they may be pressed to it, and who will know when girls are tired. Lucy is asleep and breathing softly. She has more colour in her cheeks than usual and looks, oh, so sweet. If Mr. Holmwood fell in love with her, seeing her only in the drawing room, I wonder what he would say if he saw her now. Some of the new women writers will some day start an idea that men and women should be allowed to see each other asleep before proposing or accepting. But I suppose the new woman won't condescend in future to accept. She will do the proposing herself, and a nice job she'll make of it too. <laughs> there is some consolation in that. Oh, I am so happy tonight, because dear Lucy seems better. I really believe she has turned the corner, and that we are quite over her troubles with dreaming. I should be quite happy if only I knew with Jonathan. God bless and keep him. 11th of August, 3 a.m. Diary again. No sleep now, so I may as well write. I am too agitated to sleep. We have had such an adventure, such an agonizing experience. I fell asleep as soon as I had closed my diary. Suddenly I became broad awake and sat up with a horrible sense of fear upon me and of some feeling of emptiness around me. The room was dark, so I couldn't see Lucy's bed. I stole across and felt for her. The bed was empty. I lit a match and found she was not in the room. The door was shut, but not locked as I had left it. I feared to wake her mother, who had been more than usually ill lately, so I threw on some clothes and got ready to look for her. As I was leaving, it struck me that the clothes she wore might give me some clue to her dreaming intention. Dressing gown would mean house. Dress, outside. Dressing gown and dress were both in their places. Thank God, I said to myself, she cannot be far. She is only in her nightdress. I ran downstairs and looked in the sitting room. Not there. Then I looked in all the other rooms in the house, with an ever-growing fear chilling my heart. Finally I came to the hall door and found it open. It was not wide open, but the catch of the lock had not caught. The people of the house are careful to lock the door every night, so I feared that Lucy must have gone out as she was. There was no time to think of what might happen. A vague, overmastering fear obscured all details. I took a big, heavy shawl and ran out. The clock was striking one as I was in the crescent, and there was not a soul in sight. I ran along the north terrace, but could see no sign of the white figure which I expected. At the edge of the west cliff above the pier, I looked across the harbour to the east cliff in the hope, or fear, I don't know which, of seeing Lucy in our favourite seat. There was a bright full moon with heavy black driving clouds which threw the whole scene into a fleeting diorama of light and shade as they sailed across. For a moment or two I could see nothing as the shadow of the cloud obscured St Mary's church and all around it. Then as the cloud passed I could see the ruins of the abbey coming into view and as the edge of a narrow band of light as sharp as a sword cut moved along the church, the churchyard became all gradually visible. Whatever my expectation was, it was not disappointed, for there on our favourite seat the silver light of the moon struck a half-reclining figure, snowy white. The coming of the cloud was too quick for me to see much, for shadow shut down on the light almost immediately, but it seemed to me as though something dark stood behind the seat where the white figure shone and bent over it. What it was, whether man or beast, I could not tell. I did not wait to catch another glance, but I flew down the steep steps to the pier and along by the fish market to the bridge, which was the only way to reach the east cliff. The town seemed as dead, for not a soul did I see. 
I rejoiced that it was so, for I wanted no witness of poor Lucy's condition. The time and distance seemed endless, and my knees trembled and my breath came laboured as I toiled up the endless steps to the abbey. I must have gone fast, for it seemed to me as if my feet were weighed with lead, as though every joint in my body were rusty. When I got almost to the top, I could see the seat and the white figure, for I was now close enough to distinguish it even through the spells of shadow. There was undoubtedly something long and black bending over the half-reclining white figure. I called in fright, Lucy! Lucy! And something raised a head, and from where I was I could see a white face and red gleaming eyes. Lucy did not answer, and I ran on to the entrance of the churchyard. As I entered, the church was between me and the seat, and for a moment I lost sight of her. When I came in view again, the cloud had passed, and the moonlight struck so brilliantly that I could see Lucy half reclining with her head lying over the back of the seat. She was quite alone. There was not a sign of any living thing about. When I bent over her, I could see that she was still asleep. Her lips were parted, and she was breathing, not softly as is usual with her, but in long, heavy gasps, as though striving to get her lungs full at every breath. As I came close, she put up her hand in her sleep and pulled the collar of her nightdress close around her throat. While she did so, there came a little shudder through her, as though she felt cold. I flung the warm shawl over her and drew the edges tightly round her neck, for I dreaded that she should get some deadly chill from the night air, unclad as she was. I feared to wake her all at once. So, in order to have my hands free that I might help her, I fastened the shawl at her throat with a big safety pin. But I must have been clumsy in my anxiety, and pinched or pricked her with it. For, by and by, when her breathing became quieter, she put her hand to her throat again and moaned. When I had her carefully wrapped up, I put my shoes on her feet, and then began very gently to wake her. At first she did not respond, but gradually she became more and more uneasy in her sleep moaning and sighing occasionally. At last, as time was passing fast, and for many other reasons, I wished to get her home at once. So I shook her more forcibly, till finally she opened her eyes and awoke. She did not seem surprised to see me, as of course she did not realize at once where she was. Lucy always wakes prettily, and even at such a time when her body must have been chilled with cold and her mind somewhat appalled at waking unclad in a churchyard at night, she did not lose her grace. She trembled a little and clung to me. When I told her to come at once with me home, she rose without a word with the obedience of a child. As we passed along, the gravel hurt my feet, and Lucy noticed me wince. She stopped and wanted to insist upon my taking my shoes, but I would not. However, when we got to the pathway outside the churchyard where there was a puddle of water remaining from the storm, I daubed my feet with mud, using each foot in turn on the other, so that as we went home no one, in case we should meet anyone, should notice my bare feet. Fortune favoured us, and we got home without meeting a soul. Once we saw a man who seemed not quite sober passing along a street in front of us. But we hid in a doorway till he had disappeared up an opening such as there are here, steep little closes, or wines, as they call them in Scotland. My heart beat so loud all the time that sometimes I thought I should faint. I was filled with anxiety about Lucy, not only for her health, lest she should suffer from the exposure, but for her reputation, in case the story should get wind. When we got in, and had washed our feet, and said a prayer of thankfulness, I tucked her into bed. Before falling asleep, she asked, even implored me, not to say a word to anyone, even her mother, about her sleepwalking adventure. I hesitated at first to promise, but on thinking of the state of her mother's health, and how the knowledge of such a thing would fret her, and thinking too of how such a story might become distorted, nay, infallibly would, in case it should leak out, I thought it wiser to do so. I hope I did right. I have locked the door and the key is tied to my wrist. So, perhaps I shall not be again disturbed. Lucy is sleeping soundly. The reflex of the dawn is high and far over the sea. Same day, noon. All goes well. Lucy slept till I woke her, 
and seem not to have even changed her side. The adventure of the night does not seem to have harmed her. On the contrary, it has benefited her, for she looks better this morning than she has done for weeks. I was sorry to notice that my clumsiness with the safety pin had hurt her. Indeed, it might have been serious, for the skin of her throat was pierced. I must have pinched up a piece of loose skin and transfixed it, for there are two little red points like pinpricks, and on the band of her nightdress there was a drop of blood. When I apologized and was concerned about it, she laughed and petted me, and said she did not even feel it. Fortunately, it cannot leave a scar, as it is so tiny. Same day, night. We passed a happy day. The air was clear, and the sun bright, and there was a cool breeze. We took our lunch to Mulgrave Woods, Mrs. Westenra driving by the road, and Lucy and I walking by the cliff path, and joining her at the gate. I felt a little sad myself, for I could not but feel how absolutely happy it would have been for me had Jonathan been there. However, I must only be patient. In the evening we strolled in the casino terrace, and heard some good music by Spore and Mackenzie, then went to bed early. Lucy seems more restful than she has been for some time, and fell asleep at once. I shall lock the door and secure the key the same as before, though I do not expect trouble tonight. August the 12th My expectations were wrong, for twice during the night I was awakened by Lucy trying to get out. She seemed, even in her sleep, to be a little impatient at finding the door shut, and went back to bed under a sort of protest. I woke with the dawn and heard the birds chirping outside of the window. Lucy woke too, and I was glad to see was even better than on the previous morning. All her old gaiety of manner seemed to have come back, and she came and snuggled in beside me and told me all about Arthur. I told her how anxious I was about Jonathan, and she tried to comfort me. Well, she succeeded somewhat, for though sympathy can't alter facts, it can help to make them more bearable. August the 13th. Another quiet day, and to bed with the key on my wrist as before. Again I awoke in the night, and found Lucy sitting up in bed, still asleep, pointing to the window. I got up quietly, and pulling aside the blind, looked out. It was brilliant moonlight, and the soft effect of the light over the sea and sky, merged together in one great silent mystery, was beautiful beyond words. Between me and the moonlight flitted a great bat, coming and going in great whirling circles. Once or twice it came quite close, but was, I suppose, frightened at seeing me, and flitted away across the harbour towards the abbey. When I came back from the window, Lucy had lain down again and was sleeping peaceably. She did not stir again all night. August the 14th. On the East Cliff, reading and writing all day. Lucy seems to have become as much in love with the spot as I am, and it is hard to get her away from it when it is time to come home for lunch or tea or dinner. This afternoon she made a funny remark. We were coming home for dinner, and had come to the top of the steps up from the West Pier, and stopped to look at the view, as we generally do. The setting sun, low down in the sky, was just dropping behind Kettleness. The red light was thrown over on the East Cliff and the Old Abbey, and seemed to bathe everything in a beautiful rosy glow. We were silent for a while, and suddenly Lucy murmured, as if to herself, his red eyes again. They are just the same. It was such an odd expression, a coming apropos of nothing, that it quite startled me. I slewed round a little, so as to see Lucy well without seeming to stare at her, and saw that she was in a half-dreamy state, with an odd look on her face that I could not quite make out. So I said nothing, but followed her eyes. She appeared to be looking over at our seat, whereon was a dark figure seated alone. I was a little startled myself, for it seemed for an instant as if the stranger had great eyes like burning flames. But a second look dispelled the illusion. The red sunlight was shining on the windows of St Mary's Church behind our seat, and as the sun dipped there was just sufficient change in the refraction and reflection so as to make it appear as if the light moved. 
I called Lucy's attention to the peculiar effect, and she became herself with a start, but she looked sad all the same. It may have been that she was thinking of that terrible night up there. We never referred to it, so I said nothing, and we went home to dinner. Lucy had a headache and went early to bed. I saw her asleep and went out for a little stroll myself. I walked along the cliffs to the westward and was full of sweet sadness, for I was thinking of Jonathan. When coming home, it was then bright moonlight, so bright that though the front part of our crescent was in shadow, everything could well be seen, I threw up a glance at our window and saw Lucy's head coming out. I thought that perhaps she was looking out for me, so I opened my handkerchief and waved it. She did not notice me or make any movement whatever. Just then the moonlight crept round an angle of the building and the light fell on the window. There distinctly was Lucy with her head lying up against the side of the window sill with her eyes shut. She was fast asleep and by her seated on the window sill was something that looked like a good sized bird. I was afraid she might get a chill, so I ran upstairs, but as I came into the room she was moving back to her bed, fast asleep and breathing heavily. She was holding her hand to her throat, as though to protect it from cold. I did not wake her, but tucked her up warmly. I have taken care that the door is locked and the window securely fastened. She looks so sweet as she sleeps, but she is paler than is her wont and there is a drawn, haggard look under her eyes which I do not like. I fear she is fretting about something. I wish... August the 15th. Rose later than usual. Lucy was languid and tired, and slept on after we had been called. We had a happy surprise at breakfast. Arthur's father is better, and wants the marriage to come off soon. Lucy is full of quiet joy, and her mother is glad and sorry at once. Later on in the day, she told me the cause. She is grieved to lose Lucy as her very own, but she is rejoiced that she is soon to have someone to protect her. Poor dear sweet lady. She confided to me that she has got her death warrant. She has not told Lucy and made me promise secrecy. Her doctor has told her that within a few months at most she must die, for her heart is weakening. At any time, even now, a sudden shock would be almost sure to kill her. We were wise to keep from her the affair of the dreadful night of Lucy's sleepwalking. August the 17th. No diary for two whole days. I have not had the heart to write. Some sort of shadowy pall seems to be coming over our happiness. No news from Jonathan, and Lucy seems to be growing weaker whilst her mother's hours are numbering to a close. I do not understand Lucy's fading away as she is doing. She eats well and sleeps well and enjoys the fresh air, but all the time the roses in her cheeks are fading and she gets weaker and more languid day by day. At night I hear her gasping as if for air. I keep the key of our door always fastened to my wrist at night, but she gets up and walks about the room and still sits at the open window. Last night I found her leaning out when I woke up, and when I tried to wake her I could not. She was in a faint. When I managed to restore her she was as weak as water, and cried silently between long painful struggles for breath. When I asked her how she came to be at the window, she shook her head and turned away. I trust her feeling ill may not be from the unlucky prick of the safety pin, I looked at her throat just now as she lay asleep, and the tiny wounds seem not to have healed. They are still open, and if anything, larger than before, and the edges of them faintly white. They are like little white dots with red centers. Unless they heal within a day or two, I shall insist on the doctor seeing about them. Letter Samuel F. Billington and Sons, Solicitors, Whitby, to Messrs. Carter, Patterson and Company, London, August the 17th. Dear Sirs, Herewith please receive invoice of goods sent by Great Northern Railway. Same are to be delivered to Carfax, near Perfleet, immediately on receipt at Goods Station, King's Cross. 
The house is at present empty, but enclosed, please find keys, all of which are labelled. You will please deposit the boxes, 50 in number, which form the consignment, in the partially ruined building forming part of the house and marked A on the rough diagram enclosed. Your agent will easily recognise the locality as it is the ancient chapel of the mansion. The goods leave by the train at 9.30 tonight and will be due at King's Cross at 4.30 tomorrow afternoon. As our client wishes the delivery made as soon as possible, we shall be obliged by your having teams ready at King's Cross at the time named and forthwith conveying the goods to destination. In order to obviate any delays possible through any routine requirements as to payment in your departments, we enclose cheque herewith for £10, receipt of which please acknowledge. Should the charge be less than this amount, you can return balance. If greater, we shall at once send cheque for difference on hearing from you. You are to leave the keys on coming away in the main hall of the house, where the proprietor may get them on his entering the house by means of his duplicate key. Pray do not take us as exceeding the bounds of business courtesy in pressing you in all ways to use the utmost expedition. We are, dear sirs, faithfully yours, Samuel F. Billington and Sons. Letter Messrs. Carter, Patterson and Company, London, to Messrs. Billington and Son, Whitby, August the 21st. Dear Sirs, we beg to acknowledge £10 received and to return cheque £1, 17 shillings and ninepence, amount of overplus, as shown in receipted account herewith. Goods are delivered in exact accordance with instructions and keys left in parcel in main hall as directed. We are, dear Sirs, yours respectfully. Carter, Patterson and Company. Mina Murray's Journal, August the 18th. I am happy today and write sitting on the seat in the churchyard. Lucy is ever so much better. Last night she slept well all night and did not disturb me once. The roses seem coming back already to her cheeks, though she is still sadly pale and wan-looking. If she were in any way anemic, I could understand it, but she is not. She is in gay spirits and full of life and cheerfulness. All the morbid reticence seems to have passed from her, and she has just reminded me, as if I needed any reminding of that night, that it was here on this very seat I found her asleep. As she told me, she tapped playfully with the heel of her boot on the stone slab and said, My poor little feet didn't make much noise then. I dare say poor Mr. Swales would have told me it was because I didn't want to wake up Geordie. As she was in such a communicative humour, I asked her if she had dreamed at all that night. Before she answered, that sweet puckered look came into her forehead, which Arthur, I call him Arthur from her habit, says he loves. And indeed, I don't wonder that he does. Then she went on, in a half-dreaming kind of way, as if trying to recall it to herself. I didn't quite dream, she said, but it all seemed to be real. I only wanted to be here in this spot. I don't know why, for I was afraid of something. I don't know what. I remember, though I suppose I was asleep, passing through the streets and over the bridge. A fish leapt as I went by, and I leaned over to have a look at it, and I heard a lot of dogs howling. The whole town seemed as if it must be full of dogs, all howling at once. Then I went up the steps. I have a vague memory of something long and dark with red eyes, just as we saw in the sunset, and something very sweet and very bitter all around me at once. Then I seemed sinking into deep green water, and there was a singing in my ears, as I have heard there is to drowning men. Then everything seemed passing away from me. My soul seemed to go out from my body and float about the air. I seem to remember that once the West Lighthouse was right under me, and there was a sort of agonizing feeling, as if I were in an earthquake, and I came back and found you shaking my body. I saw you do it before I felt you. Then she began to laugh. It seemed a little uncanny to me, and I listened to her breathlessly. I did not quite like it, and thought it better not to keep her mind on the subject, so we drifted to other subjects, and Lucy was like her old self again. 
When we got home, the fresh breeze had braced her up, and her pale cheeks were really more rosy. Her mother rejoiced when she saw her, and we all spent a very happy evening together. August the 19th. Joy, joy, joy. Although not all joy. At last, news of Jonathan. The dear fellow has been ill. That is why he did not write. I am not afraid to think it or to say it, now that I know. Mr. Hawkins sent me on the letter, and wrote himself oh so kindly. I am to leave in the morning, and to go over to Jonathan, and to help to nurse him if necessary, and to bring him home. Mr. Hawkins says it would not be a bad thing if we were to be married out there. I have cried over the good sister's letter till I can feel it wet against my bosom where it lies. It is of Jonathan, and must be next my heart, for he is in my heart. My journey is all mapped out, and my luggage ready. I am taking only one change of dress. Lucy will bring my trunk to London, and keep it till I send for it, for it may be that... Well, I must write no more. I must keep it to say to Jonathan, my husband. The letter that he has seen and touched must comfort me till we meet. Letter, Sister Agatha, Hospital of St. Joseph and St. Mary, Budapest, to Miss Wilhelmina Murray, August the 12th. Dear Madam, I write by desire of Mr. Jonathan Harker, who is himself not strong enough to write, though progressing well, thanks to God and St. Joseph and St. Mary. He has been under our care for nearly six weeks, suffering from a violent brain fever. He wishes me to convey his love, and to say that by this post I write for him to Mr. Peter Hawkins, Exeter, to say with his dutiful respects that he is sorry for his delay, and that all his work is completed. He will require some few weeks' rest in our sanatorium in the hills, but will then return. He wishes me to say that he has not sufficient money with him, and that he would like to pay for his staying here, so that others who need shall not be wanting for help. Believe me, yours with sympathy and all blessings, Sister Agatha. P.S. My patient being asleep, I open this to let you know something more. He has told me all about you, and that you are shortly to be his wife. All blessings to you both. He has had some fearful shock, so says our doctor, and in his delirium his ravings have been dreadful, of wolves and poison and blood, of ghosts and demons, and I fear to say of what. Be careful with him always, and that there may be nothing to excite him of this kind for a long time to come. The traces of such an illness as his do not likely die away. We should have written long ago, but we knew nothing of his friends, and there was on him nothing that anyone could understand. He came in the train from Klausenberg, and the guard was told by the station master there that he rushed into the station shouting for a ticket for home. Seeing from his violent demeanour that he was English, they gave him a ticket for the furthest station on the way thither that the train reached. Be assured that he is well cared for. He has won all hearts by his sweetness and gentleness. He is truly getting on well, and I have no doubt will in a few weeks be all himself. But be careful of him for safety's sake. There are, I pray God, and St. Joseph and St. Mary, many, many happy years for you both. Dr. Seward's Diary, August the 19th. Strange and sudden change in Renfield last night. About eight o'clock he began to get excited and to sniff about as a dog does when setting. The attendant was struck by his manner, and knowing my interest in him, encouraged him to talk. He is usually respectful to the attendant, and at times servile, but tonight the man tells me he was quite haughty, would not condescend to talk with him at all. All he would say was, I don't want to talk to you. You don't count now. The master is at hand. The attendant thinks it is some sudden form of religious mania which has seized him. If so, we must look out for squalls, for a strong man with homicidal and religious mania might be dangerous. The combination is a dreadful one. At nine o'clock I visited him myself. 
His attitude to me was the same as that to the attendant. In his sublime self-feeling, the difference between myself and the attendant seemed to him as nothing. It looks like religious mania, and he will soon think that he himself is God. These infinitesimal distinctions between man and man are too paltry for an omnipotent being. How these madmen give themselves away. The real God taketh he lest a sparrow fall. But the God created from human vanity sees no difference between the eagle and the sparrow. Oh, if men only knew. For half an hour or more, Renfield kept getting excited in greater and greater degree. I did not pretend to be watching him, but I kept strict observation all the same. All at once, that shifty look came into his eyes, which we always see when a madman has seized an idea, and with it the shifty movement of the head and the back, which asylum attendants come to know so well. He became quite quiet, and went and sat on the edge of his bed resignedly, and looked into space with lacklustre eyes. I thought I would find out if his apathy were real or only assumed, and try to lead him to talk of his pets, a theme which never failed to excite his attention. At first he made no reply, but at length said testily, Bother them all. I don't care a pin about them. What? I said. You don't mean to tell me that you don't care about spiders? The spiders at present are his hobby, and the notebook is filling up with columns of small figures. To this he answered enigmatically, The bride maidens rejoice the eyes that wait the coming of the bride. But when the bride draweth nigh, then the maidens shine not to the eyes that are filled. He would not explain himself, but remained obstinately seated on his bed all the time I remained with him. I am weary tonight, and low in spirits. I cannot but think of Lucy, and how different things might have been. If I don't sleep at once, chloral, the modern Morpheus. I must be careful not to let it grow into a habit. No, I shall take none tonight. I have thought of Lucy, and I shall not dishonour her by mixing the two. If need be, tonight shall be sleepless. Some time later. Glad I made the resolution. Gladder that I kept to it. I had lain tossing about, and heard the clock strike only twice, when the night watchman came to me, sent up from the ward, to say that Renfield had escaped. I threw on my clothes and ran down at once. My patient is too dangerous a person to be roaming about. Those ideas of his might work out dangerously with strangers. The attendant was waiting for me. He said he had seen him not ten minutes before, seemingly asleep in his bed, when he had looked through the observation trap in the door. His attention was called by the sound of the window being wrenched out. He ran back and saw his feet disappear through the window, and at once had sent up for me. He was only in his night gear and cannot be far off. The attendant thought it would be more useful to watch where he should go than to follow him, as he might lose sight of him whilst getting out of the building by the door. He is a bulky man and couldn't get through the window. I happened to be thin, so with his aid I got out but feet foremost, and as we were only a few feet from the ground, landed unhurt. The attendant told me the patient had gone to the left and taken a straight line, so I ran as quickly as I could. As I got through the belt of the trees, I saw a white figure scale the high wall which separates our grounds from those of the deserted house. I ran back at once and told the watchman to get three or four men immediately and to follow me into the grounds of Carfax, in case our friend might be dangerous. I got a ladder myself, and crossing the wall, dropped down on the other side. I could see Renfield's figure just disappearing behind the angle of the house, so I ran after him. On the far side of the house, I found him pressed close against the old iron-bound oak door of the chapel. He was talking, apparently, to someone, but I was afraid to go near enough to hear what he was saying, lest I might frighten him, or he should run off. Chasing an errant swarm of bees is nothing to following a naked lunatic when the fit of escaping is upon him. After a few minutes, however, I could see that he did not take note of anything around him, so I ventured to draw nearer to him, the more so as my men had now crossed the wall and were closing in. I heard him say, 
I am here to do your bidding, master. I am your slave, and you will reward me, for I shall be faithful. I have worshipped you long and afar off. Now that you are near, I await your commands, and you will not pass me by, will you, dear master, in your distribution of good things? Our friend is a selfish old beggar anyhow. He thinks of the loaves and fishes even when he believes he is in a real presence. His manias make a startling combination. When we closed in on him, he fought like a tiger. He is immensely strong, and he was more like a wild beast than a man. I never saw a lunatic in such a paroxysm of rage before, and I hope I shall not again. It is a mercy that we have found out his strength and his danger in good time. With strength and determination like his, he might have done wild work before he was caged. He is safe now at any rate. Jack Shepherd himself couldn't get free from the straight waistcoat that keeps him restrained, and he is chained to the wall in the padded room. His cries are at times awful, but the silences that follow are more deadly still, for he means murder in every turn and in every movement. Just now he spoke coherent words for the first time. I shall be patient, Master. It is coming. 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 So I took the hint and came to. I was too excited to sleep, but this diary has quieted me, and I feel I shall get Letter Nina Harker to Lucy Westenra, Budapest, August the 24th. My dearest Lucy, I know you will be anxious to hear all that has happened since we parted at the railway station at Whitby. Well, my dear, I got to Hull all right, and caught the boat to Hamburg, and then the train on here. I feel I can hardly recall anything of the journey, except that I knew I was coming to Jonathan, and that, as I should have to do some nursing, I had better get all the sleep I could. I found my dear one, oh, so thin and pale and weak-looking. All the resolution had gone out of his dear eyes, and that quiet dignity which I told you was in his face has vanished. He is only a wreck of himself, and he does not remember anything that has happened to him for a long time past. At least he wants me to believe so, and I shall never ask. He has had some terrible shock, and I fear it might tax his poor brain if he were to try to recall it. Sister Agatha, who is a good creature and a born nurse, tells me that he raved of dreadful things while he was off his head. I wanted her to tell me what they were, but she would only cross herself and say she would never tell, that the ravings of the sick were the secrets of God, and that if a nurse through her vocation should hear them, she should respect her trust. She is a sweet, good soul, and the next day, when she saw I was troubled, she opened up the subject again, and after saying that she could never mention what my poor dear raved about, added, I can tell you this much, my dear, that it was not about anything which he had done wrong himself, and you, as his wife-to-be, have no cause to be concerned. He has not forgotten you, or what he owes to you. His fear was of terrible and great things, which no mortal can treat of. I believe the dear soul thought I might be jealous, lest my poor dear should have fallen in love with some other girl the idea of my being jealous about Jonathan. And yet, my dear, let me whisper, I felt a thrill of joy through me when I knew that no other woman was a cause of trouble. I am now sitting by his bedside, where I can see his face while he sleeps. He is waking. When he woke, he asked me for his coat, as if he wanted to get something from the pocket. I asked Sister Agatha, and she brought me all his things. I saw that amongst them was his notebook, and was going to ask him to let me look at it, for I knew then that I might find some clue to his trouble, but I suppose he must have seen my wish in my eyes, for he sent me over to the window, saying he wanted to be quiet for a moment. 
Then he called me back, and when I came, he had his hand over the notebook, and he said to me very solemnly, Wilhelmina, I knew then that he was in deadly earnest, for he has never called me by that name since he asked me to marry him. You know, dear, my ideas of the trust between husband and wife. There should be no secret, no concealment. I have had a great shock, and when I try to think of what it is, I feel my head spin round, and I do not know if it was all real or the dreaming of a madman. You know I have had brain fever, and that is to be mad. The secret is here, and I do not want to know it. I want to take up my life here, with our marriage. For my dear Lucy, we had decided to be married as soon as the formalities are complete. Are you willing, Wilhelmina, to share my ignorance? Here is the book. Take it and keep it. Read it if you will, but never let me know unless, indeed, some solemn duty should come upon me to go back to the bitter hours, asleep or awake, sane or mad, recorded here. He then fell back exhausted, and I put the book under his pillow and kissed him. I have asked Sister Agatha to beg the superior to let our wedding be this afternoon, and am waiting her reply. She has come, and told me that the chaplain of the English Mission Church has been sent for. We are to be married in an hour, or as soon after as Jonathan awakes. Lucy, the time has come and gone. I feel very solemn, but very, very happy. Jonathan woke a little after the hour, and all was ready. He sat up in bed, propped up with pillows. He answered his, I will, firmly and strongly. I could hardly speak. My heart was so full that even these words seemed to choke me. The dear sisters were so kind. Please, God, I shall never, never forget them, nor the grave and sweet responsibility I have taken upon myself. I must tell you of my wedding present. When the chaplain and the sisters had left me alone with my husband, Oh, Lucy, it is the first time I have written the words, My husband. Left me alone with my husband, I took the book from under his pillow, wrapped it up in white paper, tied it with a little bit of pale blue ribbon which was wound round my neck, and sealed it over the knot with sealing wax, and for my seal I used my wedding ring. Then I kissed it, showed it to my husband, and told him that I would keep it so. Then it would be an outward and visible sign for us all our lives that we trusted each other, that I would never open it unless it were for his own dear sake, or for the sake of some stern duty. Then he took my hand in his, and, oh, Lucy, it was the first time he took his wife's hand, and said it was the dearest thing in all the wide world, and that he would go through all the past again to win it, if need be. The poor dear meant to have said, a part of the past. But he cannot think of time yet, and I shall not wonder if at first he mixes up not only the month, but the year. Well, my dear, what could I say? I could only tell him that I was the happiest woman in all the wide world, and that I had nothing to give him except myself, my life, my trust, and that with these went my love and my duty for all the days of my life. Then, my dear, he kissed me and drew me to him with his poor weak hands. It was like a very solemn pledge between us. Lucy, dear, do you know why I tell you all this? It is not only because it is all sweet to me, but because you have been and are very dear to me. It was my privilege to be your friend and guide when you came from the schoolroom to prepare for the world of life, and I want you to see now, and with the eyes of a very happy wife, whither duty has led me, so that in your own married life you may be as happy as I am. My dear, please God Almighty, your life may be all it promises. Long days of sunshine, with no harsh wind, no forgetting duty, no distrust. I must not wish you no pain, for that can never be. But I do hope you will be always as happy as I am now. Goodbye, my dear. I shall post this at once, and perhaps write you very soon again. I must start now 
for Jonathan is waking. I must attend to my husband. Your ever-loving Mina Harker Letter Lucy Westenrow to Mina Harker Whitby, 30th of August My dearest Mina, Oceans of love and millions of kisses, and may you soon be in your own home with your husband. I wish you could be coming home soon enough to stay with us here. This strong air would soon restore Jonathan. It has quite restored me. I have an appetite like a cormorant, and full of life and sleep well. You will be glad to know that I have quite given up walking in my sleep. I think I have not stirred out of my bed for a week, that is, once I got into it at night. Arthur says I am getting fat. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you that Arthur is here. We have such walks and drives and rides and rowing and tennis and fishing together, and I love him more than ever. He tells me that he loves me more, but I doubt that, for at first he told me he couldn't love me more than he did then. But this is all nonsense, my dear. There he is, calling to me. So, no more just at present from your loving Lucy. P.S. Mother sends her love. She seems better, poor dear. P.P.S. We are to be married on September the 28th. Dr. Seward's Diary August the 20th The case of Renfield grows even more interesting. He has now so far quieted that there are spells of cessation from his passion. For the first week after his attack he was perpetually violent. Then one night, just as the moon rose, he grew quiet and kept murmuring to himself, Now I can wait. Now I can wait. The attendant came to tell me so I ran down at once to have a look at him. He was still in the straight waistcoat and in the padded room, but the suffused look had gone from his face, and his eyes had something of their old pleading, I might almost say cringing softness. I was satisfied with his present condition, and directed him to be relieved. The attendants hesitated, but finally carried out my wishes without protest. It was a strange thing that the patient had humour enough to see their distrust, for coming close to me he said in a whisper, all the while looking furtively at them, They think I could hurt you. Fancy me hurting you, the fools. It was soothing somehow to the feelings to find myself disassociated, even in the mind of this poor madman, from the others. But all the same, I do not follow his thought. Am I to take it that I have anything in common with him, so that we are, as it were, to stand together? Or has he to gain from me some good so stupendous that my well-being is needed to him? I must find out later on. Tonight he will not speak. Even the offer of a kitten or a fully grown cat will not tempt him. He will only say, I don't take any stock in cats. I have more to think of now and I can wait. I can wait. After a while I left him. The attendant tells me that he was quiet until just before dawn. Then he began to get uneasy and at length violent, until at last he fell into a paroxysm which exhausted him so that he swooned into a sort of coma. Three nights has the same thing happened. Violent all day, then quiet from moonrise to sunrise. I wish I could get some clue to the cause. It would almost seem as if there was some influence which came and went. Happy thought. We shall tonight play sane wits against mad ones. He escaped before without our help. Tonight he shall escape with it. We shall give him a chance and have the men ready to follow in case they are required. August the 23rd. The unexpected always happens. How well Disraeli knew life. Our bird, when he found the cage open, would not fly, so all our subtle arrangements went for naught. At any rate, we have proved one thing, that the spells of quietness last a reasonable time. We shall in future be able to ease his bond for a few hours each day. 
I have given orders on the night attendant merely to shut him in the padded room, when once in he is quiet until an hour before sunrise. The poor soul's body will enjoy the relief, even if his mind cannot appreciate it. Hark! The unexpected again. I am called, and the patient has once more escaped. Later, another night adventure. Renfield artfully waited until the attendant was entering the room to inspect. Then he dashed out past him and flew down the passage. I sent word for the attendants to follow. Again we went into the ground of the deserted house and found him in the same place, pressed against the old chapel door. When he saw me, he became furious, and had not the attendant seized him in time, he would have tried to kill me. As we were holding him, a strange thing happened. He suddenly redoubled his efforts, and then he suddenly grew calm. I looked round instinctively, but could see nothing. Then I caught the patient's eye and followed it, but could trace nothing as it looked into the moonlit sky except a big bat, which was flapping its silent and ghostly way to the west. Bats usually wheel and flit about, but this one seemed to go straight on, as if it knew where it was bound for, or had some intention of its own. The patient grew calmer every instant, and presently said, You needn't tie me. I shall go quietly. Without trouble, we came back to the house. I feel there is something ominous in his calm and shall not forget this night. Lucy Westerner's Diary Hillingham, August the 24th I must imitate Mina and keep writing things down. Then we can have long talks when we do meet. I wonder when it will be. I wish she were with me again, for I feel so unhappy. Last night I seemed to be dreaming again, just as I was at Whitby. Perhaps it is the change of air, or getting home again. It is all dark and horrid to me, for I can remember nothing. But I am full of vague fear, and I feel so weak and worn out. When Arthur came to lunch, he looked quite grieved when he saw me, and I hadn't the spirit to be cheerful. I wonder if I could sleep in Mother's room tonight. I shall make an excuse and try. August the 25th. Another bad night. Mother did not seem to take to my proposal. She seems not too well herself, and doubtless she fears to worry me. I tried to keep awake, and succeeded for a while, but when the clock struck twelve, it wakened me from a doze, so I must have been falling asleep. There was a sort of scratching or flapping at the window, but I did not mind it, and I remember no more. I suppose I must then have fallen asleep. More bad dreams. I wish I could remember them. This morning I am horribly weak. My face is ghastly pale, and my throat pains me. It must be something wrong with my lungs, for I don't seem to get air enough. I shall try to cheer up when Arthur comes, or else I know he will be miserable to see. Letter Arthur Homewood to Dr. Seward Albemarle Hotel, August the 31st My dear Jack, I want you to do me a favour. Lucy is ill. That is, she has no special disease, but she looks awful and is getting worse every day. I have asked her if there is any cause. I do not dare to ask her mother, for to disturb the poor lady's mind about her daughter in her present state of health will be fatal. Mrs. Westenra has confided to me that her doom is spoken, disease of the heart, though poor Lucy does not know it as yet. I am sure there is something preying on my dear girl's mind. I am almost distracted when I think of her. To look at her gives me a pang. I told her I should ask you to see her, and though she demurred at first, I know why, old fellow, she finally consented. It will be a painful task for you, I know, old friend, but it is for her sake, and I must not hesitate to ask or you to act. You are to come to lunch at Hillingdon tomorrow, two o'clock, 
so as not to arouse any suspicion in Mrs. Westenra. After lunch, Lucy will take an opportunity of being alone with you. I shall come in for tea, and we can go away together. I am filled with anxiety, and want to consult with you alone as soon as I can after you have seen her. Do not fail me, my friend. Arthur Telegram Arthur Homewood to Seward, September the 1st. Am summoned to see my father, who is worse. Am writing. Write me fully by tonight's post. Wire me if necessary. Letter from Dr. Seward to Arthur Homewood, September the 2nd. My dear old fellow, with regard to Miss Westerner's health, I hasten to let you know at once that in my opinion there is not any functional disturbance or any malady that I know of. At the same time, I am not by any means satisfied with her appearance. She is woefully different from what she was when I saw her last. Of course you must bear in mind that I did not have full opportunity of examination such as I should wish. Our very friendship makes a little difficulty which not even medical science or custom can bridge over. I had better tell you exactly what happened, leaving you to draw in a measure your own conclusions. I shall then say what I have done and propose doing. I found Miss Westenra in seemingly gay spirits. Her mother was present, and in a few seconds I had made up my mind that she was trying all she knew to mislead her mother and prevent her from being anxious. I have no doubt she guesses, if she does not know, what need of caution there is. We lunched alone, and as we all exerted ourselves to be cheerful, we got, as some kind of reward for our labours, some real cheerfulness amongst us. Then Mrs. Westenra went to lie down, and Lucy was left with me. We went into her boudoir, and till we got there her gaiety remained, for the servants were coming and going. As soon as the door was closed, however, the mask fell from her face, and she sank down into a chair with a great sigh, and hid her eyes with her hand. When I saw that her high spirits had failed, I at once took advantage of her reaction to make a diagnosis. She said to me very sweetly, I cannot tell you how I loathe talking about myself. I reminded her that a doctor's confidence was sacred, but that you were grievously anxious about her. She caught on to my meaning at once, and settled the matter in a word. Tell Arthur everything you choose. I do not care for myself, but all for him. So, my friend, I am quite free. I could easily see that she is somewhat bloodless, but I could not see the usual anemic signs, and by a chance I was actually able to test the quality of her blood, for in opening a window which was stiff, a cord gave way, and she cut her hand slightly with the broken glass. It was a slight matter in itself, but it gave me an evident chance, and I secured a few drops of the blood and have analysed them. The qualitative analyses gives a quite normal condition, and shows, I should infer, in itself a vigorous state of health. In other physical matters I was quite satisfied that there is no need for anxiety. But as there must be a cause somewhere, I have come to the conclusion that it must be something mental. She complains of difficulty in breathing satisfactorily at times, and of heavy lethargic sleep, with dreams that frighten her, but regarding which she can remember nothing. She says that as a child she used to walk in her sleep, and then, when in Whitby, the habit came back, and that once she walked out in the night and went to the East Cliff, where Miss Murray found her. But she assures me that of late the habit has not returned. I am in doubt, and so have done the best thing I know of. I have written to my old friend and master, Professor Van Helsing of Amsterdam, who knows as much about obscure diseases as anyone in the world. I have asked him to come over, and as you told me that all things were to be to your charge, I have mentioned to him who you are and your relations to Miss Westenra. All this, my dear fellow, is only in obedience to your wishes, for I am only too proud and happy to do anything I can for her. Van Helsing would, I know, do anything for me for a personal reason. So, no matter on what ground he comes, we must accept his wishes.
Van Helsing, my dear Art, is a somewhat arbitrary man, but this is because he knows what he is talking about better than anyone else. He is a philosopher and a metaphysician, and one of the most advanced scientists of his day, and he has, I believe, an absolutely open mind. This, with an iron nerve, a temper of the ice brook, an indomitable resolution, self-command and toleration exalted from virtues to blessings, and the kindest and truest heart that beats, these form his equipment for the noble work which he is doing for mankind. Work both in theory and practice, for his views are as wide as his all-embracing sympathy. I tell you these facts that you may know why I have such confidence in him. I have asked him to come at once. I shall see Miss Westenra tomorrow again. She is to meet me at the stores, so that I may not alarm her mother by too early a repetition of my call. Yours always, John Seward. Letter Abraham Van Helsing, M.D., D.P.H., D.L.I.T., etc., etc., to Dr. Seward. September the 2nd. My good friend, when I have received your letter, I am already coming to you. By good fortune, I can leave just at once, without wrong to any of those who have trusted me. Were fortune other, then it were bad for those who have trusted for I come to my friend when he call me to aid those he holds dear. Tell your friend that when that time you suck from my wound so swiftly the poison of the gangrene from that knife that our other friend too nervous let slip, you did more for him when he wants my aids, and you call for them, than all his great fortune could do. But it is a pleasure added to do for him, your friend. It is to you that I come. Have then rooms for me at the Great Eastern Hotel, so that I may be near at hand, and please it so to arrange that we may see the young lady not too late on tomorrow, for it is likely I may have to return here that night. But if need be, I shall come again in three days, and stay longer if must. Till then, goodbye, my friend John. Van Helsing Letter Dr. Seward to Honourable Arthur Homewood September the 3rd. My dear Art, Van Helsing has come and gone. He came on with me to Hillingham and found that by Lucy's discretion her mother was lunching out so that we were alone with her. Van Helsing made a very careful examination of the patient. He is to report to me and I shall advise you, for of course I was not present all the time. He is, I fear, much concerned, but says he must think. When I told him of our friendship, and how you trust me in the matter, he said, you must tell him all you think. Tell him what I think, if you can guess it, if you will. Nay, I am not jesting. This is no jest, but life and death, perhaps more. I asked him what he meant by that, for he was very serious. This was when we had come back to town, and he was having a cup of tea before starting on his return to Amsterdam. He would not give me any further clue. You must not be angry with him, Art, because his very reticence means that all his brains are working for her good. He will speak plainly enough when the time comes, be sure. So I told him I would simply write an account of our visit, just as if I were doing a descriptive article for the Daily Telegraph. He seemed not to notice, but remarked that the smuts in London were not quite so bad as they used to be when he was a student there. I am getting his report tomorrow, if he can possibly make it. In any case, I am to have a letter. Well, as to the visit. Lucy was more cheerful than on the day I first saw her, and certainly looked better. She had lost something of the ghastly look that so upset you, and her breathing was normal. She was very sweet to the professor, as she always is, and tried to make him feel at ease, though I could see that the poor girl was making a hard struggle for it. I believe Van Helsing saw it too, for I saw the quick look under his bushy eyebrows that I knew of old. Then he began to chat of all things except ourselves and diseases, and with such an infinite geniality that I could see poor Lucy's pretense of animation merge into reality. Then, without any seeming change, he brought the conversation gently round to his visit, and suavely said, My dear young miss, I have so great pleasure because you are much beloved, 
This is much, my dear, even were there that which I do not see. They told me you were in the spirit, and that you were of a ghastly pale. To them I say, poof! And he snapped his fingers at me, and went on. But you and I shall show them how wrong they are. How can he? And he pointed at me with the same look and gesture as that which once he pointed to me in the class, on, or rather after, a particular occasion which he never fails to remind me of. Know anything of a young lady's. He has his madmans to play with, and to bring them back to happiness and to those that love them. It is much to do, and all, oh, but there are rewards in that we can bestow such happiness. But the young ladies? He has no wife, no daughter, and the young do not tell themselves to the young, but to the old, like me, who have known so many sorrows and the causes of them. So, my dear, we will send him away to smoke the cigarette in the garden, whilst you and I have a little talk all to ourselves. I took the hint and strolled about, and presently the professor came to the window and called me in. He looked grave, but said, I have made careful examination, but there is no functional cause. With you, I agree, there has been much blood lost. It has been, but is not. But the conditions of her are in no way anemic. I have asked her to send me her maid, that I may ask her one or two questions, that I may so not chance to miss nothing. I know well what she will say, and yet there is cause. There is always cause for everything. I must go back home and think. You must send telegram to me every day, and if there be cause, I shall come again. The disease for not to be all well is a disease, interest me. And the sweet young dear, she interests me too. She charm me. And for her, if not for you or disease, I come. As I tell you, he would not say a word more, even when we were alone. And so now, Art, you know all I know. I shall keep stern watch. I trust that your poor father is rallying, it must be a terrible thing to you, my dear old fellow, to be placed in such a position between two people who are both so dear to you. I know your idea of duty to your father, and you are right to stick to it. But, if need be, I shall send you word to come at once to Lucy. So, do not be over-anxious unless you hear from me. Dr. Seward's Diary, September the 4th. Zoophagus patient still keeps up our interest in him. He had only one outburst, and that was yesterday at an unusual time. Just before the stroke of noon, he began to grow restless. The attendant knew the symptoms and at once summoned aid. Fortunately, the men came at a run and were just in time, for at the stroke of noon he became so violent that it took all their strength to hold him. In about five minutes, however, he began to get more and more quiet and finally sank into a sort of melancholy in which state he has remained up to now. The attendant tells me that his screams while in the paroxysm were really appalling. I found my hands full when I got in, attending to some of the other patients who were very frightened by him. Indeed, I can quite understand the effect, for the sounds disturbed even me, though I was some distance away. It is now after the dinner hour of the asylum, and as yet my patient sits in a corner brooding with a dull, sullen, woebegone look on his face, which seems rather to indicate than to show something directly. I cannot quite understand it. Later, another change in my patient. At five o'clock I looked in on him and found him seemingly as happy and as contented as he used to be. He was catching flies and eating them, and keeping note of his capture by making nail marks on the edge of the door between the ridges of the padding. When he saw me, he came over and apologised for his bad conduct, and asked me, in a very humble, cringing way, to be led back to his own room and to have his notebook again. I thought it well to humour him. So he is back in his room with the windows open. 
He has the sugar of his tea spread out on the window sill, and is reaping quite a harvest of flies. He is not eating them now, but putting them in a box as of old, and is already examining the corners of his room to find a spider. I tried to get him to talk about the past few days, for any clue of his thoughts would be of immense help to me, but he would not rise. For a moment or two he looked very sad, and said in a sort of faraway voice, as though saying it rather to himself than to me, All over, all over, he has deserted me. No hope for me now, unless I do it for myself. Then suddenly turning to me in a resolute way, he said, Doctor, won't you be very good to me, and let me have a little more sugar? I think it will be good for me. And the flies? I said. Yes, the flies like it too, and I like the flies. Therefore I like it. And there are people who know so little as to think that madmen do not argue. I procured him a double supply, and left him as happy a man as I suppose any in the world. I wish I could fathom his mind. Midnight. Another change in him. I had been to see Miss Westenra, whom I found much better, and had just returned, and was standing at our own gate looking at the sunset, when once more I heard him yelling. As his room is on this side of the house, I could hear it better than in the morning. It was a shock to me to turn from the wonderful smoky beauty of a sunset over London, with its lurid lights, inky shadows, and all the marvellous tints that come on foul clouds, even as on foul water, and to realise all the grim sternness of my own cold stone building, with its wealth of breathing misery, and my own desolate heart to endure it all. I reached him just as the sun was going down, and from his window saw the red disk sink. As it sank, he became less and less frenzied, and just as it dipped, he stood from the hands that held him, an inert mass on the floor. It was wonderful, however, what intellectual recuperative powers lunatics have, for within a few minutes he stood up quite calmly and looked around him. I signalled to the attendants not to hold him, for I was anxious to see what he would do. He went straight over to the window and brushed out the crumbs of sugar. Then he took his fly box and emptied it outside and threw away the box. Then he shut the window and crossing over sat down on the bed. All this surprised me, so I asked him, Are you not going to keep flies any more? No, said he. I am sick of all that rubbish. He certainly is a wonderfully interesting study. I wish I could get some glimpse of his mind or the cause of his sudden passion. Stop. There may be a clue, after all, if we can find out why today his paroxysms came on at high noon and at sunset. Can it be that there is a malign influence of the sun at periods which affects certain natures, as at times the moon does others? We shall see. Telegram. Seward, London, to Van Helsing, Amsterdam. 4th of September. Patient, still better today. Telegram, Seward, London, to Van Helsing, Amsterdam, September the 5th. Patient, greatly improved. Good appetite, sleeps naturally. Good spirits, colour coming back. Telegram, Seward, London, to Van Helsing, Amsterdam, 6th of September. Terrible change for the worse. Come at once, do not lose an hour. I hold over telegram to Letter, Dr. Seward, to Honourable Arthur Holmwood, September the 6th. My dear Art, my news today is not so good. Lucy this morning had gone back a bit. There is, however, one good thing which has arisen from it. Mrs. Westenra was naturally anxious concerning Lucy, and has consulted me professionally about her. I took advantage of the opportunity, and told her that my old master, Van Helsing, the great specialist, was coming to stay with me, and that I would put her in his charge conjointly with myself. 
so now we may come and go without alarming her unduly, for a shock to her would mean sudden death, and this, in Lucy's weak condition, might be disastrous to her. We are hedged in with difficulties, all of us, my poor old fellow, but please God, we shall come through them all right. If any need, I shall write, so that if you do not hear from me, take it for granted that I am simply waiting for news. In haste, yours ever, John Seward. Dr. Seward's Diary, September the 7th. The first thing Van Helsing said to me when we met at Liverpool Street was, Have you said anything to our young friend, the lover of her? No, I said. I waited till I had seen you, as I said in my telegram. I wrote him a letter simply telling him that you were coming, as Miss Westenrow was not so well and that I would let him know if need be. Right, my friend, he said, quite right. Better he not know as yet. Perhaps he shall never know. I pray so, but if it be needed, then he shall know all. And my good friend John, let me caution you. You deal with the madmen. All men are mad in some way or the other, and insomuch as you deal discreetly with your madmen, so deal with God's madmen, too, the rest of the world. You tell not your madmen what you do, nor why you do it. You tell them not what you think. So you shall keep knowledge in its place, where it may rest, where it may gather its kind around it, and breed. You and I shall keep as yet what we know here, and here. He touched me on the heart and on the forehead, then touched himself in the same way. I have for myself thoughts at the present. Later I shall unfold to you. Why not now? I asked. It may do some good. We may arrive at some decision. He stopped and looked at me and said, My friend John, when the corn is grown, even before it has ripened, while the milk of its mother earth is in him, and the sunshine has not yet begun to paint him with his gold, the husbandman, he pulled the ear and rubbed him between his rough hands, blow away the green chaff, and say to you, Look, he is good corn. He will make good crop when the time comes. I did not see the application and told him so. For reply, he reached over and took my ear in his hand and pulled it playfully, as he used to do at lectures long ago, and said, The good husbandman tell you so then, because he knows, but not till then. But you do not find the good husbandman dig up his planted corn to see if he grow. That is for the children who play at husbandry, and not for those who take it as of the work of their life. See you now, friend John. I have sown my corn and nature has her work to do in making it sprout. If he sprout at all, there's some promise, and I wait till the ear begin to swell. He broke off, for he evidently saw that I understood. Then he went on, and very gravely. You were always a careful student, and your casebook was ever more full than the rest. You were only student then. Now you are master and I trust that good habit have not failed. Remember, my friend, that knowledge is stronger than memory, and we should not trust the weaker. Even if you have not kept the good practice, let me tell you that this case of our dear miss is one that may be, a uh, mind, I say may be, of such interest to us and others that all the rest may not make him kick the beam as your people say. Take then good note of it. Nothing is too small. I counsel you. Put down in record even your doubts and surmises. Hereafter it may be of interest to you to see how true you guess. We learn from failure, not from success. When I describe Lucy's symptoms, the same as before, but definitely more marked, he looked very grave, but said nothing. He took with him a bag in which were many instruments and drugs, 
the ghastly paraphernalia of our beneficial trade, as he once called in one of his lectures the equipment of a professor of the healing craft. When we were shown in, Mrs. Weston met us. She was alarmed, but not nearly so much as I expected to find her. Nature, in one of her beneficent moods, has ordained that even death has some antidote to its own terrors. Here, in a case where any shock may prove fatal, matters are so ordered that from some cause or other the things are not personal. Even the terrible change in her daughter, to whom she is so attached, do not seem to reach her. It is something like the way Dame Nature gathers round a foreign body an envelope of some insensitive tissue which can protect from evil that which it would otherwise harm by contact. If this be an ordered selfishness, then we should pause before we condemn any one of the vice of egoism, for there may be deeper roots for its causes than we have knowledge of. I use my knowledge of this phase of spiritual pathology and lay down a rule that we should not be present with Lucy or think of her illness more than was absolutely required. She assented readily, so readily, that I saw again the hand of nature fighting for life. Van Helsing and I were shown up to Lucy's room. If I was shocked when I saw her yesterday, I was horrified when I saw her today. She was ghastly, chalkily pale. The red seems to have gone even from her lips and gums, and the bones of her face stood out prominently. Her breathing was painful to see or hear. Van Helsing's face grew set as marble, and his eyebrows converged till they almost touched over his nose. Lucy lay motionless, and did not seem to have strength to speak, so for a while we were all silent. Then Van Helsing beckoned to me, and we went gently out of the room. The instant we had closed the door, he stepped quickly along the passage to the next door, which was open. Then he pulled me quickly in with him and closed the door. My God, he said, this is dreadful. There is no time to be lost. She will die for sheer want of blood to keep the heart's action as it should be. There must be a transfusion of blood at once. Is it you or me? I am younger and stronger, Professor. It must be me. Then get ready at once. I will bring out my bag. I am prepared. I went downstairs with him, and as we were going, there was a knock at the hall door. When we reached the hall, the maid had just opened the door, and Arthur was stepping quickly in. He rushed up to me, saying in an eager whisper, Jack, I was so anxious. I read between the lines of your letter, and have been in an agony. The dad was better, so I ran down here to see for myself. Is not that gentleman, Dr. Van Helsing? I am so thankful to you, sir, for coming. When first the professor's eye had lit upon him, he had been angry at any interruption at such a time. But now, as he took in his stalwart proportions, and recognized the strong manhood which seemed to emanate from him, his eyes gleamed. Without a pause, he said to him gravely, as he held out his hand, Sir, you have come in time. You are the lover of our dear miss. She is bad, very, very bad. Nay, my child, do not go like that. For he suddenly grew pale and sat down in a chair, almost fainting. You are to help her. You can do more than any that live. And your courage is your best help. What can I do? asked Arthur hoarsely. Tell me and I shall do it. My life is hers, and I would give the last drop of blood in my body for her. The professor has a strongly humorous side, and I could from old detect a trace of its origin in his answer. My young sir, I do not ask so much as that. Not the last. What shall I do? There was fire in his eyes, and his open nostrils quivered with intent. Van Helsing slapped him on the shoulder. Come, he said, you are a man, and it is a man we want. You are better than me, better than my friend John. Arthur looked bewildered, and the professor went on by explaining in a kindly way. 
Young miss is bad, very bad. She wants blood, and blood she must have or die. My friend John and I have consulted, and we are about to perform what we call transfusion of blood, to transfer from full veins of one to the empty veins which pine for him. John was to give his blood, as he is more stronger and young than me. Here Arthur took my hand and wrung it hard in silence. But now you are here. You are more good than us, old or young, who toil much in the world of thought. Our nerves are not so calm, and our blood not so bright than yours. Arthur turned to him and said, If you only knew how gladly I would die for her, you would understand. He then stopped, with a sort of choke in his voice. Good boy, said Van Helsing. In the not so far off, you will be happy that you have done all you can for your love. Come now and be silent. You shall kiss her once before it is done, then you must go. And you must leave at my side. Say no word to madame. You know how it is with her. There must be no shock. Any knowledge of this would be one. Come. We all went up to Lucy's room. Arthur, by directions, remained outside. Lucy turned her head and looked at us, but said nothing. She was not asleep. She was simply too weak to make the effort. Her eyes spoke to us, but that was all. Van Helsing took some things from his bag, laid them on a little table out of sight. Then he mixed a narcotic, and coming over to the bed, said cheerily, Now, little miss, here is your medicine. Drink it off like a good child. See, I lift you so that to swallow is easy. Yes. She had made the effort with success. It astonished me how long the drug took to act. This, in fact, marked the extent of her weakness. The time seemed endless until sleep began to flicker in her eyelids. At last, however, the narcotic began to manifest its potency and she fell into a deep sleep. When the professor was satisfied, he called Arthur into the room and bade him strip off his coat. Then he added, You may take that one little kiss whilst I bring over the table. Friend John, help to me. So neither of us looked whilst he bent over her. Van Helsing, turning to me, said, He is so young and strong and of blood so pure that we need not defibrinate it. Then with swiftness, but with absolute method, Van Helsing performed the operation. As the transfusion went on, something like life seemed to come back to poor Lucy's cheeks. And through Arthur's growing pallor, the joy of his face seemed absolutely to shine. After a while, I began to grow anxious, for the loss of blood was telling on Arthur, strong man as he was. It gave me an idea of what terrible strain Lucy's sister must have undergone, that what weakened Arthur only partially restored her. But the professor's face was set, and he stood watch in hand with his eyes fixed now on the patient, now on Arthur. I could hear my own heart beat. Presently he said in a soft voice, Do not stir an instant. It is enough. You attend him. I will look to her. When all was over, I could see how much Arthur was weakened. I dressed the wound and took his arm to bring him away, when Van Helsing spoke without turning round. The man seems to have eyes in the back of his head. The brave lover, I think, deserve another kiss, which he shall have presently. And as he had now finished his operation, he adjusted the pillow to the patient's head. As he did so, the narrow black velvet band, which she seemed always to wear round her throat, buckled with an old diamond buckle which her lover had given her, was dragged up a little, and showed a red mark on her throat. Arthur did not notice it, but I could hear the deep hiss of indrawn breath, which is one of Van Helsing's ways of betraying emotion. He said nothing at the moment, but turning to me said, Now. Take down our brave young lover, give him of the port wine, 
and let him lie down a little. He must then go home and rest, sleep much, eat much, that he may be recruited of what he has so given to his love. He must not stay here. Hold a moment. I may take it, sir, that you are anxious of results. Then bring it with you that in all ways the operation is successful. You have saved her life this time, and you can go home and rest easy in mind that all that can be is. I shall tell her all when she is well, and she shall love you none the less for what you have done. Goodbye. When Arthur was gone, I went back to the room. Lucy was sleeping gently, but her breathing was stronger. I could see the counterpane move as her breast heaved. By the bedside sat Van Helsing, looking at her intently. The velvet band again covered the red mark. I asked the professor in a whisper, What do you make of that mark on her throat? What do you make of it? I have not seen it yet, I answered, and then and there proceeded to loose the band. Just over the external jugular vein there were two punctures, not large, but not wholesome looking. There was no sign of disease, but the edges were white and worn looking, as if by some trituration. It had once occurred to me that this wound, or whatever it was, might be the means of that manifest loss of blood, but I abandoned the idea as soon as formed, for such a thing could not be. The whole bed would have been drenched in scarlet with the blood which the girl must have lost to leave such a pallor as she had before the transfusion. Well, said Van Helsing. Well, said I, I can make nothing of it. The professor stood up. I must go back to Amsterdam tonight, he said. There are books and things there which I want. You must remain here all night and you must not let your sight pass from her. Shall I have a nurse? I asked. We are the best nurses, you and I. You keep watch all night. See that she is well fed and that nothing disturbs her. You must not sleep all the night. Later on we can sleep, you and I. I shall be back as soon as possible. And then we may begin. May begin? I said. What on earth do you mean? We shall see, he answered as he hurried out. He came back a moment later and put his head inside the door and said, with a warning finger held up, Remember, she is in your charge. If you leave her and harm befall, you shall not... St My diary continues. September the 8th. I sat up all night with Lucy. The opiate worked itself off towards dusk, and she waked naturally. She looked a different being from what she had been before the operation. Her spirits were good, and she was full of happy vivacity, but I could see evidence of the absolute prostration of which she had undergone. When I told Mrs. Westerner that Dr. Van Helsing had directed I should sit up with her, she almost pooh-poohed the idea, pointing out her daughter's renewed strength and excellent spirits. I was firm, however, and made preparations for my long vigil. When her maid had prepared her for the night, I came in, having in the meantime had supper, and took my seat by the bedside. She did not in any way make objection, but looked at me gratefully whenever I caught her eye. After a long spell, she seemed sinking off to sleep, but with an effort seemed to pull herself together and shook it off. This was repeated several times, with greater effort and with shorter pauses as the time moved on. It was apparent she did not want to go to sleep, so I tackled the subject at once. You do not want to go to sleep, I said. No, I am afraid. Afraid to go to sleep? Why so? It is the boon we all crave for. Ah, not if you were like me. If sleep was to you a presage of horror, a presage of horror? What on earth do you mean? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. And that is what is so terrible. All this weakness comes to me in sleep, until I dread the very thought. 
But my dear girl, I said, you may sleep tonight. I am here watching you, and I can promise that nothing will happen. Ah, oh, I can trust you. I seized the opportunity and said, I promise you that if I see any evidence of bad dreams, I will wake you at once. You will? Oh, will you really? How good you are to me. Then I will sleep. And almost at the word, she gave a deep sigh of relief and sank back asleep. All night long I watched by her. She never stirred, but slept on and on in a deep, tranquil, life-giving, health-giving sleep. Her lips were slightly parted, and her breast rose and fell with the regularity of a pendulum. There was a smile on her face, and it was evident that no bad dreams had come to disturb her peace of mind. In the early morning her maid came, and I left her in her care, and took myself back home, for I was anxious about many things. I sent a short wire to Van Helsing and to Arthur, telling them of the excellent results of the operation. My own work, with its manifold arrears, took me all day to clear off. It was dark when I was able to inquire about my zoophagus patient. The report was good. He had been quiet for the past day and night. A telegram came from Van Helsing at Amsterdam whilst I was at dinner, suggesting I should be at Hillingham tonight, as it might be well to be at hand, and stating that he was leaving by the night mail and would join me early in the morning. September the 9th I was pretty tired and worn out when I got to Hillingham. For two nights I had hardly had a wink of sleep, and my brain was beginning to feel that numbness which marks cerebral exhaustion. Lucy was up and in cheerful spirits. When she shook hands with me, she looked sharply in my face and said, No sitting up tonight for you. You are worn out. I am quite well again. Indeed I am. And if there is to be any sitting up, it is I who will sit up with you. I would not argue the point, but went and had my supper. Lucy came with me, and enlivened by her charming presence, I had an excellent meal and a couple of glasses of the more than excellent port. Then Lucy took me upstairs and showed me a room next to her own where a cosy fire was burning. Now, she said, you must stay here. I shall leave this door open and my door too. You can lie on the sofa, for I know that nothing would induce any of you doctors to go to bed whilst there is a patient above the horizon. If I want anything, I shall call out and you can come to me at once. I could not but acquiesce, for I was dog-tired and could not have sat up had I tried. So on her renewing her promise to call me if she should want anything, I lay on the sofa and forgot all about everything. Lucy Westerner's Diary, September the 9th. I feel so happy tonight. I have been so miserably weak that to be able to think and move about is like feeling sunshine after a long spell of east wind out of a steel sky. Somehow Arthur feels very, very close to me. I seem to feel his presence warm about me. I suppose it is that sickness and weakness are selfish things and turn our inner eyes and sympathies on ourselves, whilst health and strength give love rain and in thought and feeling he can wander where he wills. I know where my thoughts are, if Arthur only knew. My dear, my dear, your ears must tingle as you sleep, as mine do waking. Oh, the blissful rest of last night! How I slept with that dear good Dr. Seward watching me! And tonight I shall not fear to sleep, since he is close at hand and within call. Thank everybody for being so good to me. Thank God. Good night, Arthur. Dr. Seward's Diary, September the 10th. I was conscious of the professor's hand on my head and started awake all in a second. That is one of the things we learn in an asylum at any rate. And how is our patient? Well, when I left her, or rather when she left me, I answered... Come, let us see, he said, and together we went into the room. The blind was down, and I went over to raise it gently, while Van Helsing stepped with his soft cat-like tread over to the bed. 
As I raised the blind and the morning sunlight flooded the room, I heard the professor's low hiss of inspiration, and knowing its rarity, a deadly fear shot through my heart. As I passed over, he moved back, and his exclamation of horror, Gott in Himmel, needed no enforcement from his agonized face. He raised his hand and pointed to the bed, and his iron face was drawn and ashen white. I felt my knees begin to tremble. There on the bed, seemingly in a swoon, lay poor Lucy, more horribly white and wan-looking than ever. Even the lips were white, and the gums seemed to have shrunken back from the teeth, as we sometimes see in a corpse after a prolonged illness. Van Helsing raised his foot to stamp it in anger, but the instinct of his life and all the long years of habit stood to him, and he put it down again softly. Quick, he said, bring the brandy. I flew to the dining room and returned with the decanter. He wetted the poor white lips with it, and together we rubbed palm and wrist and heart. He felt her heart. After a few moments of agonized suspense, he said, It is not too late. It beats, though but feebly. All our work is undone. We must begin again. There is no young Arthur here now. I have to call on you yourself this time, friend John. As he spoke, he was dipping into his bag and producing the instruments for transfusion. I had taken off my coat and rolled up my shirt sleeve. There was no possibility of an opiate just at present, and no need of one. So, without a moment's delay, we began the operation. After a time, it did not seem too short a time either, for the draining away of one's blood, no matter how willing it is given, is a terrible feeling, Van Helsing held up a warning finger. Do not stir, he said, but I fear that with growing strength she may awake. And that would make danger, oh, so much danger. But I shall precaution take. I shall give hypodermic injection of morphia. He proceeded then, swiftly and deftly, to carry out his intent. The effect on Lucy was not bad, for the faint seemed to merge subtly into the narcotic sleep. It was with a feeling of personal pride that I could see a faint tinge of colour steal back into the pallid cheek and lips. No man knows, till he experiences it, what it is to feel his own lifeblood drawn away into the veins of the woman he loves. The professor watched me critically. That will do, he said. Already, I remonstrated, you took a great deal more from art. To which he smiled, a sad sort of smile, and replied, He is her lover, her fiancé. You have work, much work to do for her and for others, and the present will suffice. When we stopped the operation, he attended to Lucy while I applied digital pressure to my own incision. I lay down whilst I waited his leisure to attend to me, for I felt faint and a little sick. By and by, he bound up my wound and sent me downstairs to get a glass of wine for myself. As I was leaving the room, he came after me and half whispered, Mind, nothing must be said of this. If our young lover should turn up unexpected as before, no word to him. It would at once frighten him and jealous him too. There must be none. So. When I came back, he looked at me carefully, then said, You are not much the worse. Go into the room, lie on your sofa, rest a while. Then have much breakfast, and come here to me. I followed out his orders, for I knew how right and wise they were. I had done my part, and now my next duty was to keep up my strength. I felt very weak, and in the weakness lost something of the amazement at what had occurred. I fell asleep on the sofa, wondering over and over again how Lucy had made such a retrograde movement, and how she could have been drained of so much blood with no sign anywhere to show for it. I think I must have continued my wonder in my dreams, for, sleeping and waking, my thoughts always came back to the little punctures in her throat, and the ragged, exhausted appearance of their edges, tiny though they were. 
Lucy slept well into the day, and when she woke, she was fairly well and strong, though not nearly so much as the day before. When Van Helsing had seen her, he went out for a walk, leaving me in charge with strict injunctions that I was not to leave her for a moment. I could hear his voice in the hall, asking the way to the nearest telegraph office. Lucy chatted with me quite freely, and seemed unconscious that anything had happened. I tried to keep her amused and interested. When her mother came up to see her, she did not seem to notice any change whatever, but said to me gratefully, We owe you so much, Dr. Seward, for all you have done, but you really must now take care not to overwork yourself. You are looking pale yourself. You want a wife to nurse and look after you a bit. That you do. As she spoke, Lucy turned crimson, though it was only momentarily, for her poor wasted veins could not stand for long such an unwonted drain to the head. The reaction came in excessive pallor as she turned imploring eyes on me. I smiled and nodded, laid my fingers to my lips, and with a sigh she sank back amid her pillows. Van Helsing returned in a couple of hours, and presently said to me, Now, you go home, eat much, and drink enough. Make yourself strong. I stay here tonight, and shall sit up with little miss myself. You and I must watch the case, and we must have none other to know. I have grave reasons. No, do not ask them. Think what you will. Do not fear to think even the most not probable. Good night. In the hall, two of the maids came to me and asked if they or either of them might not sit up with Miss Lucy. They implored me to let them, and when I said it was Dr. Van Helsing's wish that either he or I should sit up, they asked quite piteously to intercede with the foreign gentleman. I was much touched by their kindness. Perhaps it was because I am weak at present, and perhaps it was on Lucy's account that their devotion was manifested for over and over again have I seen similar instances of woman's kindness. I got back late for dinner, went my rounds all well, and set this down whilst waiting for sleep. It is coming. September the 11th. This afternoon I went over to Hillingham, found Van Helsing in excellent spirits and Lucy much better. Shortly after I'd arrived, a big parcel from abroad came for the professor. He opened it with much impressment, assumed of course, and showed a great bundle of white flowers. These are for you, Miss Lucy, he said. For me? Oh, Dr. Van Helsing. Yes, my dear, but not for you to play with. These are medicines. Here Lucy made a wry face. Nay, but they are not to take in a decoction, or in a nauseous form, so you need not snub that so charming nose. Or I shall point out to my friend Arthur what woes he may have to endure in seeing so much beauty that he so loves, so much distort. Hmm, my pretty miss, that bring the so nice nose all straight again. This is medicinal, but you do not know how. I put him in your windows, I make a pretty wreath, and hang him round your neck, so you sleep well. Oh, yes, they, like the lotus flower, make your trouble forgotten. It smells so like the waters of Lethe, and of the fountains of youth that the conquistador sought for in the Floridas, and find him all too late. Whilst he was speaking, Lucy had been examining the flowers and smelling them. Now she threw them down, saying with half laughter and half disgust, Oh, Professor, I believe you are only putting up a joke on me. Why, these flowers are only common garlic. To my surprise, Van Helsing rose up and said with all his sternness, his iron jaw set and his bushy eyebrows meeting, No trifling with me. I never jest. There is grim purpose in all I do, and I warn you that you do not thwart me. Take care for the sake of others, if not for your own. Then seeing poor Lucy scared, as she might well be, he went on more gently, 
Oh, little miss, my dear, do not fear me. I only do for your good. But there is much virtue for you in those so common flower. See, I place them myself in your room. I make myself the wreath that you are to wear. But, hush, no telling to others that make so inquisitive questions. We must obey. And silence is a part of obedience, and obedience is to bring you strong and well into loving arms that wait for you. Now, sit still a while. Come with me, friend John, and you shall help me deck the room in my garlic, which is all the way from Harlem, where my friend Vanderpool raised herb in his glass houses all the year. I had to telegraph yesterday, or they would not have been here. We went into the room, taking the flowers with us. The professor's actions were certainly odd, and not to be found in any pharmacopoeia that I have ever heard of. First, he fastened up the windows and latched them securely. Next, taking a handful of the flowers, he rubbed them all over the sashes, as though to ensure that every whiff of air that might get in would be laden with the garlic smell. Then, with the wisp, he rubbed all over the jamb of the door, above, below, each side and round the fireplace in the same way. It all seemed grotesque to me, and presently I said, Well, Professor, I know you always have a reason for what you do, but this certainly puzzles me. <laughs> it is well we have no sceptic here, or he would say that you are working some spell to keep out an evil spirit. Perhaps I am, he answered quietly, as he began to make the wreath which Lucy was to wear round her neck. We then waited whilst Lucy made her toilet for the night, and when she was in bed, he came and himself fixed the wreath of garlic round her neck. The last words he said to her were, Take care you do not disturb it, and even if the room feel close, do not tonight open the window or the door. I promise, said Lucy, and thank you both a thousand times for all your kindness to me. Oh, what have I done to be blessed with such dear friends? As we left the house in my fly, which was waiting, Van Helsing said, Tonight I can sleep in peace. And sleep I want. Two nights of travel, much reading in the day between, and much anxiety on the day to follow, and a night to sit up without to wink. Tomorrow in the early morning you call for me. We come together, see our pretty miss, so much more strong for my spell which I have work. Ho, ho! He seemed so confident that I, remembering my own confidence two nights before and with a baneful result, felt awe and vague terror. It must have been my weakness that made me hesitate to tell it to my friend, but I felt it all the more. Lucy Westerner's Diary, September the 12th. How good they all are to me. I quite love that dear Dr. Van Helsing. I wonder why he was so anxious about the flowers. He positively frightened me, he was so fierce. And yet he must have been right, for I feel comfort from them already. Somehow I do not dread being alone tonight, and I can go to sleep without fear. I shall not mind any flapping outside the window. Oh, the terrible struggle! I have had against sleep so often of late. The pain of the sleeplessness, or the pain of the fear of sleep, with such unknown horrors as it has for me. How blessed are some people whose lives have no fears, no dreads, to whom sleep is a blessing that comes nightly and brings nothing but sweet dreams. Well, here am I tonight, hoping for sleep, and lying like Ophelia in the play with virgin crants and maiden strumments. I never liked garlic before, but tonight it is delightful. Oh, there is peace in its smell. I feel sleep coming already. Good night, everybody. Dr. Seward's Diary, September the 13th. Called at the Barclay and found Van Helsing as usual up to time. 
The carriage ordered from the hotel was waiting. The professor took his bag, which he always brings with him now. Let all be put down exactly. Van Helsing and I arrived at Hillingham at eight o'clock. It was a lovely morning. The bright sunshine and all the fresh feeling of early autumn seemed like the completion of nature's annual work. The leaves were turning to all kinds of beautiful colours, but had not yet begun to drop from the trees. When we entered, we met Mrs. Westenra coming out of the morning room. She is always an early riser. She greeted us warmly and said, You will be glad to know that Lucy is better. The dear child is still asleep. I looked into her room and saw her, but did not go in, lest I should disturb her. The professor smiled and looked quite jubilant. He rubbed his hands together and said, Aha, I thought I had diagnosed the case. My treatment is working. To which she answered, Oh, you must not take all the credit to yourself, doctor. Lucy's state this morning is due in part to me. How do you mean, ma'am? asked the professor. Well, I was anxious about the dear child in the night, and went into her room. She was sleeping soundly, so soundly that even my coming did not wake her. But the room was awfully stuffy. There were a lot of those horrible, strong-smelling flowers about everywhere, and she had actually a bunch of them round her neck. I feared that the heavy odour would be too much for the dear child in her weak state, so I took them all away and opened a bit of the window to let in a little fresh air. You will be pleased with her, I am sure. She moved off into her boudoir, where she usually breakfasted early. As she had spoken, I watched the professor's face and saw it turn ashen grey. He had been able to retain his self-command whilst the poor lady was present, for he knew her state and how mischievous a shock would be. He actually smiled on her as he held open the door for her to pass into her room. But the instant she had disappeared, he pulled me suddenly and forcibly into the dining room and closed the door. And then for the first time in my life, I saw Van Helsing break down. He raised his hands over his head in a sort of mute despair, and then beat his palms together in a helpless way. Finally, he sat down on a chair, and putting his hands before his face, began to sob with loud, dry sobs that seemed to come from the very racking of his heart. Then he raised his arms again, as though appealing to the whole universe. God, 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 he said, what have we done? What has this poor thing done that we are so sore beset? Is there fate amongst us still, sent down from the pagan world of old, that such things must be, and in such a way? This poor mother, all unknowing, and all for the best as she thinks, does such a thing as lose her daughter, body and soul. And we must not tell her. We must not even warn her, or she die, and then both die. Oh, how are we beset? How are all the powers of the devils against us? Suddenly he jumped to his feet. Come, he said, come. We must see and act. Devils or no devils, or all the devils at once, it matters not. We fight him all the same. He went to the hall door for his bag, and together we went up to Lucy's room. Once again I drew up the blind, while Van Helsing went towards the bed. This time he did not start as he looked on the poor face, with the same awful waxen pallor as before. He wore a look of stern sadness and infinite pity. As I expected, he murmured, with that hissing inspiration of his which meant so much. Without a word he went and locked the door, 
and then began to set out on the little table the instruments for yet another operation of transfusion of blood. I had long ago recognized the necessity and begun to take off my coat, but he stopped me with a warning hand. No, he said. Today you must operate. I shall provide. You are weakened already. As he spoke, he took off his coat and rolled up his shirt sleeve. Again the operation, again the narcotic, again some return of colour to the ashy cheeks and the regular breathing of healthy sleep. This time I watched whilst Van Helsing recruited himself and rested. Presently he took an opportunity of telling Mrs. Westenrae that she must not remove anything from Lucy's room without consulting him, that the flowers were of medicinal value and that the breathing of their odour was a part of the system of cure. Then he took over the care of the case himself, saying that he would watch that night and the next, and would send me word when to come. After another hour, Lucy waked from her sleep, fresh and bright, and seemingly not much the worse from her terrible ordeal. What does it all mean? I am beginning to wonder if my long habit of life amongst the insane is beginning to tell upon my own brain. Lucy Westerner's Diary, September the 17th. Four days and nights of peace. I am getting so strong again that I hardly know myself. It is as if I had passed through some long nightmare and just awakened to see the beautiful sunshine and feel the fresh air of the morning round me. I have a dim half-remembrance of long anxious times of waiting and fearing, darkness in which there was not even the pain of hope to make present distress more poignant, and then long spells of oblivion and the rising back to life as a diver coming up through a great press of water. Since, however, Dr. Van Helsing has been with me, all the bad dreaming seems to have passed away. The noises that used to frighten me out of my wits the flapping against the windows, the distant voices which seem so close to me, the harsh sounds that came from I know not where and commanded me to do I know not what, have all ceased. I go to bed now without any fear of sleep. I do not even try to keep awake. I have grown quite fond of the garlic, and a boxful arrives for me every day from Harlem. Tonight Dr. Van Helsing is going away as he has to be for a day in Amsterdam. But I need not be watched. I am well enough to be left alone. Thank God for Mother's sake, and dear Arthur's, and for all our friends who have been so kind. I shall not even feel the change, for last night Dr. Van Helsing slept in his chair quite a lot of the time. I found him asleep twice when I woke, but I did not fear to go to sleep again, although the boughs, or bats, or... Something flapped almost angrily against the window panes. The Pall Mall Gazette, September the 18th. The Escaped Wolf. Perilous Adventure of Our Interviewer. Interview with the Keeper in the Zoological Gardens. After many inquiries and almost as many refusals, and perpetually using the words Pall Mall Gazette as a sort of talisman, I managed to find the keeper of the section of the zoological gardens in which the wolf department is included. Thomas Builder lives in one of the cottages in the enclosure behind the elephant house and was just sitting down to tea when I found him. Thomas and his wife are hospitable folk, elderly and without children, and if the specimen I enjoyed of their hospitality be of the average kind, their lives must be pretty comfortable. The keeper would not enter on what he called business until the supper was over and we were all satisfied. Then when the table was cleared and he had lit his pipe, he said, Now, sir, you can go on ask me what you want. You'll excuse me refusing to talk of personal subjects of four meals. I give the wolves and the jackals and the hyenas in all our section of their tea, for I begins to ask them questions. How do you mean, ask them questions? I queried, wishing to get him into a talkative murmur. 
Eating of them over the head with a pole is one way, a scratching of their ears is another, when gents as is flush wants a bit of a show off to their gals. I don't so mind much the first, the eating with the pole for I chucks them their dinner, but I waits till they've had their sherry and coffee, so to speak, for I tries it on with the ear scratching. Mind you, he added philosophically, there's a deal of the same nature in us as in them dear animals. Here's you a coming asking me questions about my business, and I that grumpy like, that only if you're blooming half quid I'd have seen you blowed first, for I'd answer. Not even when you ask me sarcastic like, if I'd like you to ask the superintendent if you might ask me questions. Now without offence, did I tell you to go to hell? You did. And when you said you report me for using of obscene language, that was hitting me over the head. But the half quid made that all right. I weren't a going to fight, so I waited for me food and did with me owl as the wolves, lions and tigers does. Oh, but law love your heart, now that the old woman stuck a chunk of her tea cake in me, rinsed me out with a blooming old teapot and I've lit up, you may scratch me ears for all you're worth and you won't even get a growl out of me. Drive along with your questions. I know what you're coming at, that here escaped wolf. Exactly, I said. I want you to give me your view of it. Just tell me how it happened, and when I know the facts, I'll get you to say what you consider was the cause of it, and how you think the whole affair will end. All right, Governor. This here is about the old story. That here wolf, what we call Bersica, was one of three grey ones that came from Norway to Jamrax, which we bought off him four years ago. He was a nice, well-behaved wolf, that one, ne'er gave no trouble to talk of. I'm more surprised at him for wanting to get out, nor any other animal in the place. But there, you can't trust wolves, no more nor women. Oh, don't you mind him, sir? broke in Mrs. Tom, with a cheery laugh. He's got mind in the animals so long that blessed if he ain't like an old wolf himself. But there ain't no harm in him. Well, sir, it was about two hours after feeding yesterday when I first hear any disturbance. I was making up a litter in the monkey house for a young puma which is ill. But when I heard the yelping and howling, well, I come straight away. There was Bersica a tearing like a mad thing at the bars as if he wanted to get out. There wasn't much people about that day, and close at hand was only one man, tall, thin chap, hook nose and a pointed beard with a few white hairs running through it. He had a hard, cold look, red eyes. I took a sort of dislike to him, for it seemed as if it was him as they was irritated at. He had white kid gloves on his hands, and he pointed out the animals to me, and he says, uh, Keeper, these wolves seem upset at something. Well, maybe it's you, says I, for I did not like the airs he gives himself. He didn't get angry as I hoped he would, but he smiled a kind of, well, a kind of insolent smile, with a mouth full of white sharp teeth. Oh, no. They wouldn't like me, he says. Oh, yes, they would, says I, her imitating of him. They always like a bone or two to clean their teeth with about tea time, which you has as a bag for. Well, it was an odd thing, but when the animals see us a talking, they lay down, and I went over to Bersica and he let me stroke his ears, same as ever. That there man come over, and bless but if he didn't put out his hand too, and stroke the old wolf's ears. Oh, you take care, says I. Bersicker is quick. Never mind, he says. I'm used to him. Oh, you in the business yourself, I says, taking off me hat. For a man what trades in wolves is a good friend to keepers. No, says he, not exactly in the business but I have made pets of several. And with that, he lifts his hat as polite as a lord and walks away. 
old Persica kept a looking after him till he was out of sight. Then went out, lay down in a corner. Well, last night, soon as the moon was up, the wolves here all began an owling. There weren't nothing for them to owl at. There weren't no one near except someone who was evidently calling a dog somewhere out the back in the gardens of the park road. Once or twice I went out to see if it was all right, and it was. Then the owling stopped. Just before twelve o'clock I took a look round before turning in, and bust me if when I come opposite to old Bersica's cage I see the rails broken and twisted about and the cage empty. And that's all I know for certain. Did anyone see anything else? One of our gardeners was a coming home about that time from an harmony when he sees a great big grey dog coming out through the garden edges. At least so he says. But I don't give much for it myself. For if he did, he never said a word about it to his missus when he got home. And it was only after the escape of the wolf was made known, and we'd been up all night hunting at the park for Bersica, that he remembered seeing anything. My own belief was that the harmony had got into his head. Now, Mr. Builder, can you account in any way for the escape of the wolf? Well, sir, he said, with a suspicious sort of modesty, I think I can, but I don't know as how you'll be satisfied with the theory. Certainly I shall, I said. If a man like you who knows the animals from experience can't hazard a good guess at any rate, who is even to try? Well then, sir, I accounts for it in this way. It seems to me that this here wolf escaped simply because he wanted to get out. <laughs> From the hearty way that both Thomas and his wife laughed at the joke, I could see that it had done service before, and that the whole explanation was simply an elaborate sell. I couldn't cope in badinage with the worthy Thomas, but I thought I knew a surer way to his heart. So I said, Now, nah, Mr. Builder, we'll consider that first sovereign worked off, and this brother of his waiting to be claimed when you've told me what you think will happen. Right you are, sir, he said briskly. You'll excuse me, I know, for a chaffing of you. But the old woman here winked at me, which was as much as telling me to go on. Oh, well, I never, said the old lady. My opinion is this. That here wolf is an hiding off somewheres. The gardener, what didn't remember, said he was galloping northwards faster than an horse could go. But I don't believe him. You see, sir, wolves don't gallop no more than dogs does, they not being built that way. Wolves is a fine thing in a story book, and I dare say when they gets in packs, and does be chewing something that's more a fear than they is, they can make a devil of a noise and chop it up, whatever it is. But Lord bless you, in real life, a wolf is only a low creature, not half so clever as a good dog, and not half a caught as much fight in him. This one ain't been used to fighting, or even to providing for himself. And more like, he's somewhere around the park hiding, shivering of, and, if he thinks at all, wondering where he's to get his breakfast from. Or maybe he's got down some area, and is in some coal cellar. Oh, ho, ho, my eye! Won't some cook get a rum start when she sees his green eyes are shining at her out of the dark? <laughs> If he can't get his food, he's bound to look for it. And mayhap, he may chance to light on a butcher's shop, maybe. If he doesn't, and some nursemaid goes a-walking off with a soldier, leaving of the infant in the perambulator, well, I shouldn't be surprised if the census is one babby the less. Mm, that's all. I was handing him the half-sovereign when something came bobbing up against the window, and Mr. Builder's face doubled its natural length with surprise. God bless me, he said, if there ain't old Bersica come back by yourself. He went to the door and opened it, a most unnecessary proceeding, it seemed to me. I have always thought 
that a wild animal never looks so well as when some obstacle of pronounced durability is between us. A personal experience has intensified rather than diminished that idea. After all, however, there is nothing like custom, for neither Builder nor his wife thought any more of the wolf than I should of a dog. The animal itself was as peaceful and well-behaved as that father of all picture wolves, Red Riding Hood's quondam friend, while seeking her confidence in masquerade. The whole scene was an unutterable mixture of comedy and pathos. The wicked wolf that for half a day had paralysed London, set all the children in the town shivering in their shoes, was there in a sort of penitential mood, and was received and petted like a sort of vulpine prodigal son. Old Builder examined him all over with most tender solicitude, and when he had finished with his penitent, said, There! Uh, I knew the poor old chap would get into some kind of trouble, didn't I say it all along? Here his head's all cut and full of broken glass. He's been getting over some blooming wall or other. It's a shame that people are allowed to top their walls with broken bottles. This year what comes of it? Come along, Bursica. He took the wolf and locked it up in a cage with a piece of meat that satisfied in quantity at any rate the elementary conditions of the patted calf and went off to report. I came off too to report the only exclusive information that is given today regarding the strange escapade at the zoo. Dr. Seward's Diary, September the 17th. I was engaged after dinner in my study posting up my books, which through press of other work and the many visits to Lucy had fallen sadly into arrears. Suddenly the door was burst open and in rushed my patient with his face distorted with passion. I was thunderstruck, for such a thing as a patient getting of his own accord into the superintendent's study is almost unknown. Without an instant's pause, he made straight at me. He had a dinner knife in his hand, and I saw he was dangerous. I tried then to keep the table between us. He was too quick and too strong for me, however, for before I could get my balance, he had struck at me and cut my left wrist rather severely. Before he could strike again, however, I got in my right, and he was sprawling on his back on the floor. My wrist bled freely, and quite a little pool of blood trickled onto the carpet. I saw that my friend was not intent on further effort, and occupied myself binding up my wrist, keeping a wary eye on the prostrate figure all the time. When the attendants rushed in, and we turned our attention to him, his employment positively sickened me. He was lying on his belly on the floor, licking up like a dog the blood which had fallen from my wounded wrist. He was easily secured, and to my surprise went with the attendants quite placidly, simply repeating over and over again, The blood is the life. The blood is the life. I cannot afford to lose blood just at present. I have lost too much of late for my physical good, and then the prolonged strain of Lucy's illness and its horrible phases is telling on me too. I am overexcited and weary, and I need rest, rest, rest. Happily, Van Helsing has not summoned me, so I need not forgo my sleep. Tonight, I could not well do without it. Telegram Van Helsing, Antwerp to Seward, Carfax. Sent to Carfax, Sussex, as no county given, delivered late by twenty-four hours. September the 17th. Do not fail to be at Hillingham tonight. If not watching all the time, frequently visit to see that flowers are as placed. Very important. Do not fail. Shall be with you as soon as possible after arrival. Dr. Seward's Diary, September the 18th. Just off for train to London. The arrival of Van Helsing's telegram filled me with dismay. A whole night lost, and I know by bitter experience what may happen in a night. 
Of course, it is possible that all may be well. But what may have happened? Surely there is some horrible doom hanging over us that every possible accident could thwart us in all we try to do. I shall take this cylinder with me and then I can complete my entry on Lucy's phonograph. Memorandum left by Lucy Westenra September the 17th, night. I write this and leave it to be seen so that no one may by chance get into any trouble through me. This is an exact record of what took place tonight. I feel I am dying of weakness and have barely strength to write, but it must be done if I die in the doing. I went to bed as usual, taking care that the flowers were placed as Dr. Van Helsing directed, and soon fell asleep. I was wakened by the flapping at the window, which had begun after the sleepwalking on the cliff at Whitby, when Mina saved me, and which now I know so well. I was not afraid, but I did wish that Dr. Seward was in the next room, as Dr. Van Helsing said he would be, so that I might have called him. I tried to go to sleep, but could not. Then there came to me the old fear of sleep, and I determined to keep awake. Perversely, sleep would try to come when I did not want it. So as I feared to be alone, I opened my door and called out, Is there anybody there? There was no answer. I was afraid to wake Mother, so closed the door again. Then, outside in the shrubbery, I heard a sort of howl like a dog's, but more fierce and deeper. I went to the window and looked out, but could see nothing except a big bat, which had evidently been buffeting its wings against the window. So I went back to bed again, but determined not to go to sleep. Presently the door opened and Mother looked in. Seeing by my moving that I was not asleep, she came in and sat by me. She said to me, even more sweetly and softly than her wont, I was uneasy about you, darling, and came in to see that you were all right. I feared she might catch cold sitting there, and asked her to come in and sleep with me, so she came into bed and lay down beside me. She did not take off her dressing gown, for she said she would only stay a while, then go back to her own bed. As she lay there in my arms, and I in hers, the flapping and buffeting came to the window again. She was startled and a little frightened, and cried out, What is that? I tried to pacify her, and at last succeeded, and she lay quiet. But I could hear her poor dear heart still beating terribly. After a while there was the low howl again in the shrubbery, and shortly after there was a crash at the window, and a lot of broken glass was hurled on the floor. The window blind blew back with the wind that rushed in, and in the aperture of the broken panes there was the head of a great gaunt grey wolf. Mother cried out in fright and struggled up into a sitting posture, clutching wildly at anything that would help her. Amongst other things, she clutched the wreath of flowers that Dr. Van Helsing insisted on my wearing round my neck and tore it away from me. For a second or two she sat up, pointing at the wolf and there was a strange and horrible gurgling in her throat. Then she fell over as if struck with lightning, and her head hit my forehead and made me dizzy for a moment or two. The room and all round seemed to spin around. I kept my eyes fixed on the window, but the wolf drew his head back, and a whole myriad of little specks seemed to come blowing in through the broken window, and wheeling and circling round like the pillar of dust that travellers describe when there is a simoom in the desert. I tried to stir, but there was some spell upon me, and dear mother's poor body, which seemed to grow cold already, for her dear heart had ceased to beat, weighed me down, and I remembered no more for a while. The time did not seem long, but very, very awful, till I recovered consciousness again. 
Somewhere near, a passing bell was tolling. The dogs all round the neighbourhood were howling, and in our shrubbery, seemingly just outside, a nightingale was singing. I was dazed and stupid with pain and terror and weakness, but the sound of the nightingale seemed like the voice of my dead mother come back to comfort me. The sounds seemed to have awakened the maids too, for I could hear their bare feet pattering outside my door. I called to them, and they came in. When they saw what had happened, and what it was that lay over me in the bed, they screamed out. The wind rushed in through the broken window, and the door slammed too. They lifted off the body of my dear mother, and laid her, covered up with a sheet, on the bed after I had got up. They were all so frightened and nervous that I directed them to go to the dining room and each have a glass of wine. The door flew open for an instant and closed again. The maids shrieked, then went in a body to the dining room. I laid what flowers I had on my dear mother's breast. When they were there, I remembered what Dr. Van Helsing had told me, but somehow I didn't like to remove them, and besides, I would have some of the servants sit up with me now. I was surprised that the maids did not come back. I called them, but got no answer, so I went to the dining room to look for them. My heart sank when I saw what had happened. They all four lay helpless on the floor, breathing heavily. The decanter of sherry was on the table half full, but there was a queer, acrid smell about it. I was suspicious and examined the decanter. It smelt of laudanum, and looking on the sideboard, I found that the bottle which Mother's doctor used for her did use. The bottle was empty. What am I to do? What am I to do? I am back in the room with Mother. I cannot leave her, and I am alone save for the sleeping servants, whom someone has drugged. Alone with the dead. I dare not go out, for I can hear the low howl of the wolf coming through the broken window. The air seems full of specks, floating and circling in the draught from the window, and the lights, the lights burn blue and dim. What am I to do? God shield me from harm this night. I shall hide this paper in my breast, where they shall find it when they come to lay me out. My dear mother God, it is time that I go too. Goodbye, dear Arthur, if I should not survive this night. God keep you, dear, and God help me. Dr. Seward's Diary, September the 18th. I drove at once to Hillingham and arrived early. Keeping my cab at the gate, I went up the avenue alone. I knocked gently and rang as quietly as possible, for I feared to disturb Lucy or her mother, and hoped to bring only the servant to the door. After a while, finding no response, I knocked and rang again. Still no answer. I cursed the laziness of the servants that they should lie abed at such an hour for it was now ten o'clock, and so rang and knocked again, but more impatiently, still without response. Hitherto I had blamed only the servants, but now a terrible fear began to assail me. Was this desolation but another link in the chain of doom which seemed drawing tight round us? Was it indeed a house of death to which I had come too late? I knew that minutes and even seconds of delay might mean hours of danger to Lucy if she had had again one of those frightful relapses. So I went round the house to try if I could find by chance an entry somewhere. I could find no means of ingress. Every window and door was fastened and locked, and I returned baffled to the porch. As I did so, I heard the rapid pit-pat of a swiftly driven horse's feet. They stopped at the gate, and a few seconds later I met Van Helsing running up the avenue. When he saw me, he gasped out, Then it was you, and just arrived. 
How is she? Are we too late? Did you not get my telegram? I answered as quickly and coherently as I could that I had only got the telegram early in the morning and had not lost a minute in coming here and that I could not make anyone in the house hear me. He paused and raised his hat as he said solemnly, Then I fear we are too late. God's will be done. With his usual recuperative energy, he went on, Come, if there be no way to get in, we must make one. Time is all in all to us now. We went round to the back of the house, where there was a kitchen window. The professor took a small surgical saw from his case, and handing it to me, pointed to the iron bars which guarded the window. I attacked them at once, and had very soon cut through three of them. Then, with a long, thin knife, we pushed back the fastening of the sashes and opened the window. I helped the professor in and followed him. There was no one in the kitchen or in the servants' rooms, which were close at hand. We tried all the rooms as we went along, and in the dining room, dimly lit by the rays of light through the shutters, we found the four servant women lying on the floor. There was no need to think of them dead, for their stentorious breathing and the acrid smell of laudanum in the room left no doubt as to their condition. Van Helsing and I looked at each other as we moved away, and he said, We can attend to them later. Then we ascended to Lucy's room. For an instant or two we paused at the door to listen, but there was no sound that we could hear. With white faces and trembling hands, we opened the door gently and entered the room. How shall I describe what we saw? On the bed lay two women, Lucy and her mother. The latter lay farthest in, and she was covered with a white sheet, the edge of which had been blown back by the draught through the broken window, showing the drawn white face with a look of terror fixed upon it. By her side lay Lucy, with face white, still more drawn. The flowers which had been round her neck we found upon her mother's bosom, and her throat was bare, showing the two little wounds which we had noticed before, but now looking horribly white and mangled. Without a word, the professor bent over the bed, his head almost touching poor Lucy's breast. Then he gave a quick turn of his head, as of one who listens. Leaping to his feet, he cried out to me, It is not too late. Quick, quick, bring the brandy. I flew downstairs and returned with it, taking care to smell and taste it, lest it too were drugged like the decanter of the sherry which I had found on the table. The maids were still breathing, but more restlessly, and I fancied that the narcotic was now wearing off. I did not stay to make sure, but returned to Van Helsing. He rubbed the brandy, as on another occasion, on her lips and gums, and on her wrists and the palms of her hands. He said to me, I can do this, all that can be at the present. You go wake the maids, flick them in the face with a wet towel, and flick them hard. Make them get heat and fire and a warm bath. The poor soul is nearly as cold as that beside her. She will need to be heated before we can do anything more. I went downstairs at once, and found little difficulty in waking three of the women. The fourth was only a young girl, and the drug had evidently affected her more strongly. So I lifted her onto the sofa and let her sleep. The others were dazed at first, but as remembrance came back to them, they cried and sobbed in a hysterical manner. I was stern with them, however, and would not let them talk. I told them that one life was bad enough to lose, and that if they delayed, they would sacrifice Miss Lucy. So, sobbing and crying, they went about their way, half clad as they were, and prepared fire and water. Fortunately, the kitchen and boiler fires were still alive, and there was no lack of hot water. We got a bath, and carried Lucy out as she was, and placed her in it. Whilst we were busy chafing her limbs, there was a knock on the hall door. One of the maids ran off, hurried on some clothes, and opened it. Then she returned, and whispered to us that there was a gentleman who had come with a message from Mr. Holmwood. I bade her simply tell him that he must wait, for we could see no one now. 
she went away with the message and engrossed with our work I clean forgot all about him I never saw in all my experience the professor work in such deadly earnest I knew as he knew that it was a stand-up fight with death and in a pause told him so he answered me in a way that I did not understand but with the sternest look that his face could wear he said if that were all I would stop here where we are now and let her fade away into peace for I see no light in life over her horizon he went on with his work with if possible renewed and more frenzied vigor presently we both began to be conscious that the heat was beginning to have some effect Lucy's heart beat a trifle more audibly to the stethoscope and her lungs had a perceptible movement Van Helsing's face almost beamed as we lifted her from the bath and rolled her in a hot sheet to dry her he said to me my young friend the first gain is ours check to the king we took Lucy into another room which had by now been prepared laid her in the bed and forced a few drops of brandy down her throat I noticed that Van Helsing tied a soft silk handkerchief round her throat she was still unconscious and quite as bad as if not worse than we had ever seen her Van Helsing called in one of the women told her to stay with her not to take her eyes off her till we returned then beckoned me out of the room we must consult as to what is to be done he said as we descended the stairs in the hall he opened the dining room door and we passed in he closing the door carefully behind him the shutters had been opened but the blinds were already drawn down with that obedience to the etiquette of death which the British women of the lower classes always rigidly observes the room was therefore dimly dark it was however light enough for our purposes Van Helsing's sternness was somewhat relieved by a look of perplexity he was evidently torturing his mind about something so I waited for an instant then he spoke what are we to do now where are we to turn for help we must have another transfusion of blood and that soon or that poor girl's life won't be worth an hour's purchase you are exhausted already I am exhausted too I fear to trust these women even if they would have courage to submit what are we to do for someone who will open his veins for her what's the matter with me anyhow the voice came from the sofa across the room and its tones brought relief and joy to my heart for they were those of Quincy Morris Van Helsing started angrily at the first sound but his face softened and a glad look came into his eyes as I cried out Quincy Morris and rushed towards him with outstretched hands what brought you here I cried as our hands met I guess ah is the cause he then handed me the telegram have not heard from Seward for three days and am terribly anxious cannot leave father still in same condition send me word how Lucy is do not delay Homewood I think I came just in the nick of time look you know you have only to tell me what to do Van Helsing then strode forward took his hand and looked him straight in the eyes a brave man's blood is the best thing on earth when a woman is in trouble you're a man and no mistake well the devil may work against us for all he's worth but God sends us men when we want them once again we went through the ghastly operation I have not the heart to go through it with the details Lucy had got a terrible shock and it told on her more than before for though plenty of blood went through her veins her body did not respond to the treatment as well as on other occasions her struggle back into life was something frightful to see and hear however the action of both lungs and heart improved and Van Helsing made a subcutaneous injection of morphia as before and with good effect her faint became a profound slumber 
The professor watched her whilst I went downstairs with Quincy Morris and sent one of the maids to pay off the cabmen who were waiting. I left Quincy lying down after having a glass of wine and told the cook to get him a good breakfast. Then a thought struck me and I went back to the room where Lucy now was. When I came softly in, I found Van Helsing with a sheet or two of notepaper in his hand. He had evidently read it and was thinking it over as he sat with his hand to his brow. There was a look of grim satisfaction in his face as one who has had a doubt sold. He handed me the paper, saying only, it dropped from Lucy's breast when we had carried her to the bath. When I read it, I stood looking at the professor and after a pause asked him, in God's name, what does it all mean? Was she or is she mad? Or what sort of horrible danger is it? I was so bewildered, I did not know what to say more. Van Helsing put out his hand, took the paper and said, You not trouble about it now. Forget it for the present. You shall know and understand all in good time. But it will be later. And now, what is that you came to me to say? This brought me back to fact, and I was all myself again. I came to speak about the certificate of death. If we do not act properly and wisely, there may be an inquest, and that paper would have to be produced. I am in hopes that we need have no inquest for if we had, it would surely kill poor Lucy if nothing else did. I know and you know, and the other doctor who attended her knows, that Mrs. Westenra had disease of the heart, and we can certify that she died of it. Let us fill up the certificate at once, and I shall take it myself to the registrar, and then go to the undertaker. Good. Oh, my friend, John. Well thought of. Truly, Miss Lucy... If she be sad in the foes that beset her, is at least happy in the friends that love her. One, two, three, all open their veins for her, besides one old man. Yes, I know, friend John. I'm not blind. I love you all the more for it. Now, go. In the hall I met Quincy Morris with a telegram for Arthur, telling him that Mrs. Westerner was dead that Lucy had been ill, but was now getting on better, and that Van Helsing and I were with her. I told him where I was going, and he hurried me out. But as I was going, he said, When you come back, Jack, uh, may I have uh, two words with you all to ourselves? I nodded in reply and went out. I found no difficulty about the registration, and arranged with the local undertaker to come up in the evening to measure for the coffin and to make the arrangements. When I got back, Quincy was waiting for me. I told him I would see him as soon as I knew about Lucy, and went up to her room. She was still sleeping, and the professor seemingly had not moved from his seat by her side. From his putting his finger to his lips, I gathered that he expected her to wake before long, and was afraid of forestalling nature. So I went down to Quincy, and took him into the breakfast room, where the blinds were not drawn down, and which was a little more cheerful, or rather less cheerless than the other rooms. When we were alone, he said to me, Jack Seward, I don't want to shove myself in anywhere where I've no right to be. But this is no ordinary case. You know I love that girl, and I wanted to marry her. But although that's all past and gone, I can't help feeling anxious all the same. What is it that's wrong with her? The Dutchman, and a fine old fellow he is, I can see that, said that time you two came into the room that you must have another transfusion of blood, and that both you and he were exhausted. Now I know well that you medical men speak in camera, and that a man must not expect to know what they consult about in private. But this is no common matter, and whatever it is, I have done my part. Now it's not that so. That's so, I said. Then he went on. I take it that both you and Van Helsing had done already what I did today. Is not that so? That's so. And I guess I was in it too. 
when I saw him four days ago down at his own place, he looked queer. <laughs> I have not seen anything pulled down so quick since I was on the pampas, and had a mare that I was fond of go to grass all in a night. One of those big bats that they call vampires had got at her in the night, and what with his gorge and the vein left open, there wasn't enough blood in her to let her stand up, and I had to put a bullet through her she lay. Now, Jack, if you may tell me without betraying confidences, Arthur was the first. Now, is not that so? As he spoke, the poor fellow looked terribly anxious. He was in a torch of suspense regarding the woman he loved, and his utter ignorance of the terrible mystery which seemed to surround her intensified his pain. His very heart was bleeding, and it took all the manhood of him, and there was a royal lot of it too, to keep him from breaking down. I paused before answering, for I felt I must not betray anything which the professor wished kept secret. But already he knew so much, guessed so much, there could be no reason for not answering. So I answered in the same phrase. That's so. And how long has this been going on? About ten days. Ten days? Then I guess, Jack Seward, that that poor pretty creature that we all love has that put into her veins within that time the blood of four strong men. Oh, man alive! Her whole body wouldn't hold it. Then coming close to me, he spoke in a fierce half-whisper. What took it out? I shook my head. That, I said, is the crux. Van Helsing is simply frantic about it, and I am at my wit's end. I can't even hazard a guess. There has been a series of little circumstances which have thrown out all our calculations as to Lucy being properly watched. But these shall not occur again. Here we stay until all be well or ill. Quincy held out his hand. You count me in, he said. You and the Dutchman will tell me what to do, and I'll do it. When she woke late in the afternoon, Lucy's first movement was to feel to her breast, and to my surprise, produce the paper which Van Helsing had given me to read. The careful professor had replaced it where it had come from, lest on waking she should be alarmed. Her eye then lit on Van Helsing, and on me too, and gladdened. Then she looked round the room, and seeing where she was, shuddered. She gave a loud cry, and put her poor thin hands before her pale face. We both understood what that meant, that she had realized to the full her mother's death. So we tried what we could to comfort her. Doubtless, sympathy eased her somewhat, but she was very low in thought and spirit, and wept silently and weakly for a long time. We told her that either or both of us would now remain with her all the time. This seemed to comfort her. Towards dusk, she fell into a doze. Here a very odd thing occurred. While still asleep, she took the paper from her breast and tore it in two. Van Helsing stepped over and took the pieces from her. All the same, however, she went on with the action of tearing, as though the material were still in her hands. Finally, she lifted her hands and opened them, as though scattering the fragments. Van Helsing seemed surprised, and his brows gathered as if in thought. September the 19th. All last night she slept fitfully, being always afraid to sleep, and something weaker when she woke from it. The professor and I took in turns to watch, and we never left her for a moment unattended. Quincy Morris said nothing about his intention, but I knew that all night long he patrolled round and round the house. When the day came, its searching light showed the ravages in poor Lucy's strength. She was hardly able to turn her head, and the little nourishment which she could take seemed to do her no good. 
At times she slept, and both Van Helsing and I noticed the difference in her between the sleeping and the waking. Whilst asleep, she looked stronger, although more haggard, and her breathing was softer. Her open mouth showed the pale gums drawn back from the teeth, which thus looked positively longer and sharper than usual. When she woke, the softness of her eyes evidently changed the expression, for she looked her own self, although a dying one. In the afternoon, she asked for Arthur, and we telegraphed for him. Quincy went off to meet him at the station. When he arrived, it was nearly six o'clock, and the sun was setting full and warm, and the red light streamed in through the window and gave more colour to her pale cheeks. When he saw her, Arthur was simply choked with emotion, and none of us could speak. In the hours that had passed, the fits of sleep, or the comatose condition that passed for it, these had grown more frequent, so that the pauses when conversation was possible were shortened. Arthur's presence, however, seemed to act as a stimulant. She rallied a little, spoke to him more brightly than she had done since we arrived. He too pulled himself together and spoke as cheerily as he could, so that the best was made of everything. It is now nearly one o'clock, and he and Van Helsing are sitting with her. I am to relieve them in a quarter of an hour, and I am entering this on Lucy's phonograph. Until six o'clock they are to try to rest. I fear that tomorrow will end our watching, for the shock has been too great. The poor child cannot rally. God help us all. Letter Mina Harker to Lucy Westenroe Unopened by her September the 17th My dearest Lucy, it seems an age since I heard from you, or indeed, since I wrote. You will pardon me, I know, for all my faults when you have read all my budget of news. Well, I got my husband back all right. When we arrived at Exeter, there was a carriage waiting for us, and in it, though he had an attack of gout, dear Mr. Hawkins, he took us to his own house, where there were rooms for all of us which were nice and comfortable, and we dined together. After dinner, Mr. Hawkins said, My dears, I want to drink your health and prosperity, and may every blessing attend you both. I know you both from children, and have, with love and pride, seen you grow up. Now I want you to make your home here with me. I have left to me neither child nor chick. All are gone, and in my will I have left you everything. I cried, Lucy dear, as Jonathan and the old man clasped hands. Our evening was a very, very happy one. So here we are installed in this beautiful old house, and from both my bedroom and drawing-room I can see the great elms of the cathedral close, with their great black stems standing out against the old yellow stone of the cathedral. I can hear the rooks overhead cawing and cawing and chattering and gossiping all day, after the manner of rooks and humans, and I am busy, I need not tell you, my dear, in arranging things and housekeeping. Jonathan and Mr. Hawkins are busy all day, for now that Jonathan is a partner, Mr. Hawkins wants to tell him all about the clients. How is your dear mother getting on? I wish I could run up to town for a day or two to see you, my dear, but I dare not go yet, with so much on my shoulders, and Jonathan wants looking after still. He is beginning to put some flesh on his bones again, but he was terribly weakened by the long illness. Even now he sometimes starts out of his sleep in a sudden way and awakes all trembling, until I can coax him back to his usual placidity. However, thank God, these occasions grow less frequent as the days go on, and that in time they will pass away altogether, I trust. And now I have told you my news, let me ask yours. When are you to be married, and where, and who is to perform the ceremony, and what are you to wear, and is it to be public or a private wedding? Tell me all about it, my dear. Tell me all about everything, for there is nothing which interests you which is not dear to me. Jonathan asked me to send you his respectful duty, 
but I do not think that is good enough from the junior partner of the important firm of Hawkins and Harker. And so, as you love me, and he loves me, and I love you with all the moods and tenses of the verb, I send you simply his love instead. Goodbye, my dearest Lucy, and all blessings on you. Yours, Nina Harker. Report from Patrick Hennessy, M.D., M.R.C.S., L.K.Q., C.P.I., etc., etc., to John Seward, M.D., September the 20th. My dear sir, in accordance with your wishes, I enclose report of the conditions of everything left in my charge. With regard to patient Renfield, there is more to say. He has had another outbreak, which might have had a dreadful ending, but which, as it fortunately happened, was unattended with any unhappy results. This afternoon, a carrier's cart with two men made a call at the empty house whose grounds are but on ours, the house to which you will remember the patient twice ran away. The men stopped at our gate to ask the porter their way as they were strangers. I was myself looking out of the study window, having a smoke after dinner, and saw one of them come up to the house. As he passed the window of Renfield's room, the patient began to rate him from within, and called him all the foul names he could lay his tongue to. The man, who seemed a decent fellow enough, contented himself by telling him to shut up for a foul-mouthed beggar, whereupon our man accused him of robbing him, wanting to murder him, and said he would hinder him if he were to swing for it. I opened the window and sighed to the man not to notice. So he contented himself after looking over the place and making up his mind as to what kind of place he had got by, and said, Lord bless you, sir, I wouldn't mind what was said to me in a blooming madhouse. I pity ye and the governor for having to live in the house with a wild beast like that. Then he asked the way civilly enough, and I told him where the gate of the empty house was. He went his way, followed by the threats, curses, and revilings from our man. I went down to see if I could make out any cause for his anger, since he is usually such a well-behaved man, and except for his violent fits, nothing of the kind has ever occurred. I found him, to my astonishment, quite composed and most genial in his manner, I tried to get him to talk of the incident, but he blandly asked me questions as to what I meant, and led me to believe that he was completely oblivious of the affair. It was, I am sorry to say, only another instance of his cunning, for within half an hour I had heard of him again. This time he had broken out through the window of his room and was running down the avenue. I called to the attendants to follow me and ran after him, for I feared he was intent on some mischief. My fear was justified when I saw the same cart which had passed before coming down the road having on it great wooden boxes. The men were wiping their foreheads and were flushed in face, as if with violent exercise. Before I could get up to him, the patient had rushed at them, pulling one of them off the cart, beginning to knock his head against the ground. If I had not seized him just at that moment, I believe he would have killed the man there and then. The other fellow jumped down and struck him over the head with the butt-end of his heavy whip. It was a terrible blow, but he did not seem to mind it. But seizing him also, he struggled with the three of us, pulling us to and fro as if we were kittens. You know I am no lightweight, and the others were both burly men. At first he was silent in his fighting. But as we began to master him, and the attendants were putting a straight coat on him, he began to shout, I'll frustrate them. They shan't rob me. They shan't murder me by inches. I'll fight for my lord and master. And all sorts of similar incoherent ravings. It was with very considerable difficulty that they got him back to the house and put him in the padded room. One of the attendants had a broken finger. However, I set it all right, and he is going on well. The two carriers were at first loud in their threats of action for damages, and promised to rain all the penalties of the law on us. 
Their threats were, however, mingled with some sort of indirect apology for the defeat of two of them by a feeble madman. They said if it had not been for the way their strength had been spent in carrying and raising the heavy boxes to the cart, they would have made short work of him. They gave as another reason for their defeat the extraordinary state of drought to which they had been reduced by the dusty nature of their occupation and the reprehensible distance from the scene of their labours of any place of public entertainment. I quite understood their drift, and after a stiff glass of grog, or rather more of the same, and with each a sovereign in hand, they made light of the attack, and swore they would encounter a worse madman any day for the pleasure of meeting so blooming good a bloke as your correspondent. I took their names and addresses in case they might be needed. They are as follows. Jack Smollett of Dudding's Rents, King George's Road, Great Walworth, and Thomas Snelling, Peter Parley's Row, Guide Court, Bethnal Green. They are both in the employment of Harris and Sons, Moving and Shipment Company, Orange Master's Yard, Soho. I shall report to you any matter of interest occurring here, and shall wire you at once if there be anything of importance. Believe me, dear sir, yours faithfully, Patrick Hennessy. Letter Mina Harker to Lucy Westenra. Unopened by her. September the 18th. My dearest Lucy, such a sad blow has befallen us. Mr. Hawkins has died very suddenly. Some may not think it so sad for us, but we had both come so to love him that it really seems as though we had lost a father. I never knew either father or mother, so the dear old man's death is a real blow to me. Jonathan is greatly distressed. It is not only that he feels sorrow, deep sorrow, for the dear good man who has befriended him all his life, and now at the end has treated him like his own son, and left him a fortune which to people of our modest bringing up is wealth beyond the dreams of avarice, but Jonathan feels it on another account. He says the amount of responsibility which it puts upon him makes him nervous. He begins to doubt himself. I try to cheer him up, and my belief in him helps him to have belief in himself. But it is here that the great shock that he experienced tells upon him most. Oh, it is too hard that a sweet, simple, noble, strong nature such as his, a nature which enabled him, by our dear good friend's help, to rise from clerk to master in a few years, should be so injured that the very essence of its strength is gone. Forgive me, dear, if I worry you with my troubles in the midst of your own happiness. But, Lucy, dear, I must tell someone, for the strain of keeping up a brave and cheerful appearance to Jonathan tries me, and I have no one here that I can confide in. I dread coming up to London, as we must do the day after tomorrow, for poor Mr. Hawkins left in his will that he was to be buried in the grave with his father. As there are no relations at all, Jonathan will have to be the chief mourner. I shall try to run over to see you, my dearest, if only for a few minutes. Forgive me for troubling you. With all blessings, your loving Mina Harker. Dr. Seward's Diary, September the 20th. Only resolution and habit can let me make an entry tonight. I'm too miserable, too low-spirited, too sick of the world and all in it, including life itself. And I would not care if I heard this moment the flapping of the wings of the angel of death. And he has been flapping those wings to some purpose of late. Lucy's mother, Arthur's father, and now. Let me get on with my work. I duly relieved Van Helsing in his watch over Lucy. We wanted Arthur to go to rest also, but he refused at first. It was only when I told him that we should want him to help us during the day, and that we must not all break down for want of rest, lest Lucy should suffer, that he agreed to go. Van Helsing was very kind to him. Come, my dear child, he said, come with me. You are sick and weak 
and have had much sorrow, much mental pain, as well as that tax on your strength that we know of. You must not be alone, for to be alone is to be full of fears and alarms. Come, come to the drawing room. There is a big fire, and there are two sofas. You shall lie on one, and I on the other, and our sympathy will comfort for each other, even though we do not speak, and even if we sleep. Arthur went off with him, casting back a longing look on Lucy's face, which lay on her pillow almost whiter than the lawn. She lay quite still, and I looked round the room to see that all was as it should be. I could see that the professor had carried out in this room, as in the other, his purpose of using the garlic. The whole of the window sashes reeked with it, and round Lucy's neck, over the silk handkerchief which Van Helsing made her keep on, there was a rough chaplet of the same odorous flowers. Lucy was breathing somewhat stentoriously, and her face was at its worst, for the open mouth showed the pale gums. Her teeth, in the dim uncertain light, seemed longer and sharper than they had been in the morning. In particular, by some trick of the light, the canine teeth looked longer and sharper than the rest. I sat down by her, and presently she moved uneasily. At the same moment there came a sort of dull flapping or buffeting at the window. I went over to it softly, and peeped out by the corner of the blind. There was a full moonlight, and I could see that the noise was made by a great bat, which wheeled round, doubtless attracted by the light, although so dim, and every now and again struck the window with its wings. When I came back to my seat, I found that Lucy had moved slightly, and torn away the garlic flowers from her throat. I replaced them as well as I could, and sat watching her. Presently she woke, and I gave her food, as Van Helsing had prescribed. She took but a little, and that languidly. There did not seem to be with her now the unconscious struggle for life and strength that had hitherto so marked her illness. It struck me as curious that the moment she became conscious, she pressed the garlic flowers close to her. It was certainly odd that whenever she got into that lethargic state, with the stentorious breathing, she put the flowers from her, but that when she waked, she clutched them close. There was no possibility of making any mistake about this, for in the long hours that followed, she had many spells of sleeping and waking, and repeated both actions many times. At six o'clock, Van Helsing came to relieve me. Arthur had then fallen into a doze, and he mercifully let him sleep on. When he saw Lucy's face, I could hear the hissing in draw of his breath, and he said to me in a sharp whisper, Draw up the blind. I want light. Then he bent down, and with his face almost touching Lucy's, examined her carefully. He removed the flowers, and lifted the silk handkerchief from her throat. As he did so, he started back, and I could hear his ejaculation, My God, as it was smothered in his throat. I bent over and looked too, and as I noticed, some queer chill came over me. The wounds on the throat had absolutely disappeared. For fully five minutes, Van Helsing stood looking at her with his face at its sternest. Then he turned to me and said calmly, She is dying. It will not be long now. It will be much difference, mark me, whether she dies conscious or in her sleep. Wake that poor boy, let him come and see the last. He trusts us, and we have promised him. I went to the dining room and waked him. He was dazed for a moment, but when he saw the sunlight streaming in through the edges of the shutters, he thought he was late, and expressed his fear. I assured him that Lucy was still asleep, but told him, as gently as I could, that both Van Helsing and I feared that the end was near. He covered his face with his hands, 
and slid down on his knees by the sofa, where he remained perhaps for a minute, with his hands buried, praying, whilst his shoulders shook with grief. I took him by the hand and raised him up. Come, I said, my dear old fellow, summon all your fortitude. It will be best and easiest for her. When we came into Lucy's room, I could see that Van Helsing had, with his usual forethought, been putting matters straight and making everything look as pleasing as possible. He had even brushed Lucy's hair, so that it lay on the pillow in its usual shiny ripples. When we came into the room, she opened her eyes, and seeing him, whispered softly, Arthur, oh my love, I am glad you have come. He was stooping to kiss her when Van Helsing motioned him back. No, he whispered, not yet. Hold her hand. It will comfort her more. So Arthur took her hand, knelt beside her, and she looked at her best, with all the soft lines matching the angelic beauty of her eyes. Then gradually her eyes closed, and she sank to sleep. For a little, her breast heaved softly, and her breath came and went like a tired child's. Then, insensibly, there came a strange change, a change which I had noticed in the night. Her breathing grew stentorious, the mouth opened, and the pale gums drawn back made the teeth look longer and sharper than ever. In a sort of sleep-waking, vague, unconscious way, she opened her eyes, which were now dull and hard at once, and said in a soft, voluptuous voice, such as I had never heard from her lips, Arthur, oh, my love, I am so glad you have come. Kiss me. Arthur bent eagerly over to kiss her, but at that instant Van Helsing, who, like me, had been startled by her voice, swooped upon him, and catching him by the neck with both hands, dragged him back with a fury of strength which I never thought he could have possessed, and actually hurled him almost across the room. Not for your life, he said. Not for your living soul and hers. And he stood between them like a lion at bay. Arthur was so taken aback, that he did not for a moment know what to do or say, and before any impulse of violence could seize him, he realized the place and the occasion, and he stood silent and waited. I kept my eyes fixed on Lucy, as did Van Helsing, and we saw a spasm as of rage flit like a shadow across her face. The sharp teeth champed together. Then her eyes closed, and she breathed heavily. Very shortly after, she opened her eyes in all their softness, and putting out her pale, thin hand, took Van Helsing's great brown one, drawing it to her, and kissed it. My true friend, she said in a faint voice, but with untellable pathos, my true friend and his. Oh, guard him and give him peace. I swear it, said he solemnly, kneeling beside her and holding up his hand as one who registers an oath. Then he turned to Arthur and said to him, Come, my child, take her hand in yours, kiss her on the forehead and only once. Their eyes met instead of their lips, and so they parted. Lucy's eyes closed, and Van Helsing, who had been watching closely, took Arthur's arm and drew him away. Then Lucy's breathing became stentorious again, and all at once it ceased. It is all over, said Van Helsing. She is dead. I took Arthur by the arm and led him away to the drawing room, where he sat down and covered his face with his hands, sobbing in a way that nearly broke me down to see. I went back to the room 
and found Van Helsing looking at poor Lucy, and his face was sterner than ever. Some change had come over her body. Death had given back part of her beauty, for her brow and cheeks had recovered some of their flowing lines. Even the lips had lost their deadly pallor. It was as if the blood, no longer needed for the working of the heart, had gone to make the harshness of death as little rude as it might be. We thought her dying while she slept, and sleeping when she died. I stood beside Van Helsing and said, Ah, well, poor girl, there is peace for her at last. It is the end. He turned to me and said with grave solemnity, Not so, alas, not so. It is only the beginning. When I asked him what he meant, he only shook his head and answered, We can do nothing as yet. Wait and see. The funeral was arranged for the next succeeding day, so that Lucy and her mother might be buried together. I attended to all the ghastly formalities, and the urban undertaker proved that his staff were afflicted, or blessed, with something of his own obsequious suavity. Even the woman who performed the last offices of the dead remarked to me, in a confidential, brother professional way, when she had come out from the death chamber, she makes a very beautiful corpse, sir. It's quite a privilege to attend on her. It's not too much to say that she will do credit to our establishment. I noticed that Van Helsing never kept far away. This was possible from the disordered state of things in the household. There were no relatives at hand, and as Arthur had to be back the next day to attend at his father's funeral, we were unable to notify anyone who should have been bidden. Under the circumstances, Van Helsing and I took it upon ourselves to examine papers, etc. He insisted upon looking over Lucy's papers himself. I asked him why, for I feared that he, being a foreigner, might not be quite aware of English legal requirements, and so might, in ignorance, make some unnecessary trouble. He answered me, I know, I know. You forget that I am a lawyer as well as a doctor. But this is not altogether for the law. You knew that when you avoided the coroner. I have more than him to avoid. There may be papers such as this. As he spoke, he took from his pocketbook the memorandum which had been in Lucy's breast and which she had torn in her sleep. When you find anything of the solicitor who is for the late Mrs. Westenra, seal all her papers, write to him tonight. For me, I watch here in the room, and in Miss Lucy's old room all night, and I myself search for what may be. It is not well that her very thoughts go into the hands of strangers. I went on with my part of the work, and in another half hour had found the name and address of Mrs. Westerner's solicitor, and had written to him. All the poor old lady's papers were in order. Explicit directions regarding the place of burial were given. I had hardly sealed the letter, when to my surprise Van Helsing walked into the room, saying, Can I help you, friend John? I am free, and if I may, I may be of service to you. Have you got what you looked for? I asked. To which he replied, I did not look for any specific thing. I only hoped to find and find I have all that there was. Only some letters, a few memoranda and a diary new begun. But I have them here, and we shall for the present say nothing of them. I shall see that poor lad tomorrow evening, and with his sanction I shall use some. When we had finished the work in hand, he said to me, Now, friend John, I think we may to bed. We want sleep, both you and I, and rest to recuperate. Tomorrow we shall have much to do, but for tonight there is no need of us. Alas! 
Before turning in, we went to look at poor Lucy. The undertaker had certainly done his work well, for the room was turned into a small chapel. There was a wilderness of beautiful white flowers, and death was made as little repulsive as might be. The end of the winding sheet was laid over the face. When the professor bent over and turned it gently back, we both stared at the beauty before us, the tall wax candles showing a sufficient light to note it well. All Lucy's loveliness had come back to her in death, and the hours that had passed, instead of leaving traces of decays effacing fingers, had but restored the beauty of life till positively I could not believe my eyes that I was looking at a corpse. The professor looked sternly grave. He had not loved her as I had, and there was no need for tears in his eyes. He said to me, Remain till I return, and left the room. He came back with a handful of wild garlic from the box waiting in the hall, but which had not been opened, and placed the flowers amongst the others on and around the bed. Then he took from his neck, inside his collar, a little golden crucifix, and placed it over the mouth. He restored the sheet to its place, and we came away. I was undressing in my own room, when with a tap at the door he entered, and at once began to speak. Tomorrow I want you to bring me, before night, a set of post-mortem knives. Must we make an autopsy? I asked. Yes and no. I want to operate, but not as you think. Let me tell you now, but not a word to another. I want to cut off her head and take out her heart. Ah! You are a surgeon, and so shocked. You, whom I have seen with no tremble of hand or heart, do operations of life and death that make the rest shudder. Oh, but I must not forget, my dear friend John, that you loved her. And I have not forgotten it, for it is I that shall operate, and you must only help. I would like to do it tonight, but for Arthur I must not. He will be free after his father's funeral tomorrow, and he will want to see her, to see it. Then, when she is coffined, ready for the next day, you and I shall come when all sleep. We shall unscrew the coffin lid, and shall do our operation, and then replace all, so that none know, save we alone. But why do it at all? The girl is dead. Why mutilate her poor body without need? And if there is no necessity for a post-mortem, and nothing to gain by it, no good to her, to us, to science, to human knowledge, why do it? Without such it is monstrous. For answer, he put his hand on my shoulder, and said with infinite tenderness, Friend John, I pity your poor bleeding heart and I love you the more because it does so bleed. If I could, I would take on myself the burden that you do bear. But there are things that you know not, but that you shall know, and bless me for knowing, though they are not pleasant things. John, my child, you have been my friend now for many years, and yet did you ever know me to do anything without good cause? I may err, uh, I am but a man, but I believe in all I do. Was it not for these causes that you sent for me when the great trouble came? Yes. Were you not amazed, nay horrified, when I would not let Arthur kiss his love, though she was dying, and snatched him away with all my strength? Yes. And yet you saw how she thanked me with her so beautiful dying eyes, her voice too, and so weak, and yet she kiss my rough old hand and bless me. Yes. And did you not hear me swear promise to her, that so she closed her eyes, grateful? Yes. Well, I have good reason now for all I want to do. You have for many years, trust me. You have believed me weeks past, when things be so strange, you might well doubt. Believe me yet a little, friend John. 
If you trust me not, then I must tell what I think, and that is not perhaps well. And if I work, as work I shall, no matter trust or no trust, without my friend trusting me, I work with heavy heart and feel, oh, so lonely, when I want all help and courage that may be. He paused for a moment, and then went on solemnly. Friend John, there are strange and terrible days before us. Let us not be two, but one, that so we work to a good end. Will you not have faith in me? I took his hand and promised him. I held my door open as he went away and watched him go into his room and close the door. As I stood without moving, I saw one of the maids pass silently along the passage. She had her back towards me, so she did not see me, and go into the room where Lucy lay. The sight touched me. Devotion is so rare, and we are so grateful to those who show it unasked to those we love. Here was a poor girl putting aside the terrors which she naturally had of death, to go watch alone by the bier of the mistress whom she loved, so that the poor clay might not be lonely till laid to eternal rest. I must have slept long and soundly, for it was broad daylight when Van Helsing waked me by coming into my room. He came over to my bedside and said, You need not trouble about the knives. We shall not do it. Why not? I asked, for his solemnity of the night before had greatly impressed me. Because, he said sternly, it is too late, or too early. See, and here he held up the little golden crucifix. This was stolen in the night. How stolen, I asked in wonder, since you have it now. Because I get it back from the worthless wretch who stole it, from the woman who robbed the dead and the living. Her punishment will surely come, but not through me. She knew not altogether what she did, and thus, unknowing, she only stole. Now we must wait. He went away on the word, leaving me with a new mystery to think of, a new puzzle to grapple with. The forenoon was a dreary time, but at noon the solicitor came, Mr. Marquand of Holman Sons, Marquand and Lidderdale. He was very genial and very appreciative of what we had done, and took off our hands all cares as to details. During lunch he told us that Mrs. Westerner had for some time expected sudden death from her heart, and had put her affairs in absolute order. He informed us that, with the exception of a certain entail property of Lucy's father, which now in default of direct issue went back to a distant branch of the family, the whole estate, real and personal, was left absolutely to Arthur Holmwood. When he had told us so, he went on, Frankly, we did our best to prevent such a testamentary disposition, and pointed out certain contingencies that might leave her daughter either penniless, or not so free as she should be to act regarding a matrimonial alliance. Indeed, we pressed the matter so far that we almost came into a collision, for she asked us if we were or were not prepared to carry out her wishes. Of course, we had then no alternative but to accept we were right in principle, and ninety-nine times out of a hundred we should have proved by the logic of events the accuracy of our judgment. Frankly, however, I must admit that in this case any other form of disposition would have rendered impossible the carrying out of her wishes, for by her predeceasing her daughter the latter would have come into possession of the property, and even had she only survived her mother by five minutes, her property would, in case there was no will, and a will was a practical impossibility in such a case, have been treated at her decease as under intestacy. In which case, Lord Godalming, though so dear a friend, would have had no claim in the world, and the inheritors, being remote, would not be likely to abandon their just rights for sentimental reasons regarding an entire stranger. I assure you, my dear sirs, I am rejoiced at the result, perfectly rejoiced. He was a good fellow, 
but his rejoicing at the one little part in which he was officially interested of so great a tragedy was an object lesson in the limitations of sympathetic understanding. He did not remain long, but said he would look in later and see Lord Godalming. His coming, however, had been a certain comfort to us, since it assured us that we should not have to dread hostile criticism as to any of our acts. Arthur was expected at five o'clock, so a little before that time we visited the death chamber. It was so in very truth for now both mother and daughter lay in it. The undertaker, true to his craft, had made the best display he could of his goods, and there was a mortuary air about the place that lowered our spirits at once. Van Helsing ordered the former arrangement to be adhered to, explaining that, as Lord Godalming was coming very soon, it would be less harrying to his feelings to see all that was left of his fiancée quite alone. The undertaker seemed shocked at his own stupidity, and exerted himself to restore things to the condition in which we left them the night before, so that when Arthur came, such shocks to his feeling as we could avoid were saved. Poor fellow! He looked desperately sad and broken. Even his stalwart manhood seemed to have shrunk somewhat under the strain of his much-tried emotions. He had, I knew, been very genuinely and devotedly attached to his father, and to lose him, and at such a time, was a bitter blow to him. With me he was as warm as ever, and to Van Helsing he was sweetly courteous, but I could not help seeing that there was some constraint with him. The professor noticed it too, and motioned me to bring him upstairs. I did so, and left him at the door of the room, as I felt he would like to be quite alone with her, but he took my arm and led me in, saying huskily, you loved her too, old fellow. She told me all about it. And there was no friend had a closer place in her heart than you. I don't know how to thank you for all you have done for her. I can't think yet. Here he suddenly broke down and threw his arms round my shoulders and laid his head on my breast, crying, Oh, Jack, Jack! What shall I do? The whole of life seems to have gone from me all at once. And there is nothing in the wide world for me to live for. I comforted him as well as I could. In such cases, men do not need much expression. A grip of the hand, the tightening of an arm over the shoulder, a sob in unison are expressions of sympathy dear to a man's heart. I stood still and silent till his sobs had died away. Then I said softly to him, Come and look at her. Together we moved over to the bed, and I lifted the lawn from her face. God, how beautiful she was! Every hour seemed to be enhancing her loveliness. It frightened and amazed me somewhat, and as for Arthur, he fell a-trembling, and finally was shaken with doubt, as with an ague. At last, after a long pause, he said to me in a faint whisper, Jack, is she really dead? I assured him sadly that it was so, and went on to suggest, for I felt that such a horrible doubt should not have life for a moment longer than I could help, that it often happened that after death faces became softened and even resolved into their youthful beauty, that this was especially so when death had been preceded by an acute or prolonged suffering. It seemed to quite do away with any doubt. Then, after kneeling beside the couch for a while, and looking at her lovingly and long, he turned aside. I told him that that must be goodbye, as the coffin had to be prepared. So he went back, took her dead hand in his, kissed it, and bent over and kissed her forehead. He came away, fondly looking back over his shoulder as he came. I left him in the drawing-room, and told Van Helsing that he had said good-bye. So the latter went to the kitchen to tell the undertaker's men to proceed with the preparations and to screw up the coffin. When he came out of the room again, I told him of Arthur's question, 
and he replied, I am not surprised. Just now I doubted for a moment myself. We all dined together, and I could see that poor Art was trying to make the best of things. Van Helsing had been silent all dinner time, but when we lit our cigars he said, Lord, but Arthur then interrupted him. Oh, no, 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 not that, for God's sake. Not yet, at any rate. Forgive me, my dear sir, I do not mean to speak offensively. It is only because my loss is so recent. The professor answered very sweetly, I only use that name because I was in doubt. I must not call you a mister, and I have grown to love you. <laughs> yes, my dear boy, to love you, as Arthur. Arthur held out his hand and took the old man's warmly. Call me what you will, he said. I hope I may always have the title of a friend. And let me say that I am at a loss for words to thank you for your goodness to my poor dear. He then paused a moment and went on. I know that she understood your goodness even better than I do. And if I were rude or in any way wanting at that time that you acted so, that you remember... The professor nodded. You must forgive me. Van Helsing answered with a grave kindness. I know it was hard for you to quite trust me then, for to trust such violence needs to understand. And I take it that you do not, that you cannot trust me now, for you do not understand. And there may be more times when I shall want you to trust when you cannot, and may not, and must not understand. But the time will come when your trust shall be whole and complete in me, and when you shall understand as though the sunlight himself shone through. Then you shall bless me from first to last for your own sake, and for the sake of others, and for her dear sake, to whom I swore to protect. And indeed, indeed, my dear sir, said Arthur warmly, I shall in always trust you. I know and believe you have a very noble heart, and you are Jack's friend, and you were hers. You shall do what you like. The professor cleared his throat a couple of times, as though about to speak, and finally said, May I ask of you something now? Certainly. You know that Mrs. Westenra left you all her property? No. Oh dear, I never thought of it. And as it is all yours, you have a right to deal with it as you will. I want you to give me permission to read all Miss Lucy's papers and letters. Believe me, it is no idle curiosity. I have a motive of which, be sure, she would have approved. I have them all here. I took them before we knew that all was yours, so that no strange hand might touch them. No strange eye look through words into her soul. I shall keep them, if I may. Even you may not see them yet. But I shall keep them safe. No word shall be lost, and in the good time I shall give them back to you. It is a hard thing I ask, but you will do it, will you not, for Lucy's sake? Arthur spoke out heartily, like his old self. My dear Dr. Van Helsing, you may do what you will. I feel that in saying this I am doing what my dear one would have approved. I shall not trouble you with questions till the time comes. The old professor stood up and said more solemnly, And you are right. There will be pain for us all. But it will not all be pain, nor will this pain be the last. We and you too... You most of all, my dear boy, will have to pass through the bitter water before we reach the sweet. But we must be brave of heart, unselfish, and do our duty, and all will be well. I slept on a sofa in Arthur's room that night. Van Helsing did not go to bed at all. He went to and fro as if patrolling the house, and was never out of sight of that room where Lucy lay strewn with the wild garlic flowers which sent through the odour of lily and rose